And Purdue going to the Final Four means Tennessee is not. Stillman and company, 1025-1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. Live from the Busy Bee Plumbing Game Studios. Very excited, by the way, to have them aboard. Again, uh, their game studios here today. Ian is here today. Hello, Ian. What up, what up? So let's start right on that. Let's start on the Tennessee-Purdue game yesterday. Now... All of the basketball bennies. I did not hear Robbie and Joe today. I'm sure it was wonderful. I'll listen to it probably after the show. You know, when I get to, my day was kind of thrown around differently today. I had to get my annual physical done today, which let me tell everybody out there, get your annual physical done. But anywho, so I'll listen to Robbie and Joe probably later today, but I did not hear them. I'm sure, because I read Joe's column in The Athletic, I'm sure there was a lot of, it was a great game, and it sucked that one team had to lose, and that's the difference between Purdue and Tennessee is just a little bit, and Zach Eady is so great, and Purdue, bullcrap. We're not doing that today. We're not doing what all the basketball bennies out there are doing, which is celebrating what was a great game of college basketball, because I believe that the Tennessee Volunteers should be in the Final Four today. And I feel bad for Vol fans. And I feel bad for that basketball team that they're not in the Final Four today. And I think that on some levels, it was a travesty what happened yesterday. And I think there are three specific things that stood out to me. Number one, the end of the first half run Tennessee is up 11. Matt Painter calls timeout. Now, I don't know why Matt Painter and Purdue, I don't know why they're allowed to call timeout, and Rick Barnes is not. But yesterday, I had that moment where I looked up to the sky, and I saw the old man, and I said, I'm sure they had a meeting. Because that we, I have been banging on Rick Barnes for his lack of use of a timeout in situations like that. Ian, how long have I been banging on Rick Barnes for that for? I don't know. Guess. Mm, a year or Seven two? years? I don't know. Something like, I mean, I we used to, the arguments on the Jared and the GM show used to be, you don't know how many meetings they've had about calling timeout. They've talked about it so many times, you don't, and yet this freaking coach will not call timeout. Tennessee was up 11 freaking points, and Purdue called timeout because that's what you do in basketball is when one team goes on a big run you call timeout you slow the momentum not rick barnes so tennessee ends up with a 13 point swing and goes into the second half down by two inexcusable the game was flying out of their hands that's when you call timeout you sit everybody down and again this is the ncaa tournament so when you call timeout they go to commercial so these timeouts are longer So you call timeout, you sit everybody down, and you say, okay, hey, calm down. It was an 11-point lead. Now it's a five-point lead, but we're okay. But not this stubborn old pop-pop on the sideline. I got no sympathy for Barnes today, by the way. None. And this is coming from a guy who, you know, really wanted Tennessee to win for his sake because he has been much maligned for crapping his pants in all of these big games, and it just is kind of like it's who he is. I'm sorry. But he had an 11-point lead in the first half, and he did nothing to stop Purdue's comeback. Charles Barkley said after the game was over, or excuse me, he said at halftime, he said, if Tennessee loses the game, this is where they lost it. Tennessee never, ever, ever recovered from that into the first half a nine minute run at some time the coach has to put his foot down call time he's got to do something but not rick barnes the second thing the officiating was horrendous yesterday and i feel really bad for tennessee fans on this front because i've spent my entire life listening to tennessee fans complain after they lose games that they got cheated by the refs And 99.9% of the time, Tennessee fans are just being crybabies. Like when they threw golf balls on the field and mustard bottles after the Ole Miss football game. 
But in this case yesterday, they got screwed. And I'm going to tell you how. Because I understand it's really hard to officiate a game with Zach Eady in the paint because he's a monster. You know, it kind of reminds me of Shaquille O'Neal at LSU a little bit where it's like every play is a foul, but then are we going to stop the game? They're going to run out of players if we call it. And then, well, you know, are we letting them play? Are we letting them bang around? Are they letting? My problem with the officiating yesterday was I thought it was just too inconsistent. You know, I mean, on one side of the floor, we're going to call a hand check in, in the paint because a walk is using the forearm, which is technically a foul. So we're going to call a walk on the foul. Then the next time down, when Dalton connects coming off of a screen and you've got lawyer grabbing onto the side of his shorts, we're not going to call that. And I'm like, if we're going to call the ticky tack underneath here, we've got to call it over there. And I didn't think they did a very good job of that. A walk is fifth foul. I thought was, uh, you know, a little banging around there. He's going for the rebound. Edie's going for the rebound. I mean, they would all the time, anytime a shot went up, Edie would push somebody or he'd kind of body them out of the way and he'd get to the rebound. They never call it. It was ridiculous yesterday. And, and quite frankly, I'm going to be honest with you. I felt like Tennessee was in a really tough spot where they didn't really know what they could do because, again, some trips down the floor, they'd call something a foul, and then the next time down the floor, they wouldn't call anything a foul. And I'm not saying Tennessee didn't foul. I mean, there were times where Estrella, I thought, was basically just grabbing, you know, almost going to take Edie's arm out of his socket. But if we're going to call it one time, we got to call it the whole time. It's got to be consistent, and it's got to be consistent on both ends of the floor, and I didn't think it was. So I think Rick Barnes blew it. I think the officials blew it. And the third place I'm going to go is Dalton Connect. And I know you're going to say, wait a minute, Jared. Dalton Connect had a gazillion points yesterday. What are you talking about? It was everybody else. It was Adu who didn't play well. It was Awaka who fouled out of the game. It was Ziegler who couldn't hit a shot. It was Vescovy who gets a wide-open look at a three-pointer right before halftime, and he hits the front iron. Here's where I'm putting this on Dalton Connect. This was a mano imano showdown. Their guy versus your guy. Just like tonight in the women's basketball game, right? It's going to be Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese. And I know there will be four other players for Iowa and there will be four other players for LSU. And I'm sure the other players for LSU are better than the other players for Iowa. But at the end of the day, it's not bird and four other dudes versus magic and four other dudes. It's Larry versus magic. Yesterday, we had the two best players in the country playing against each other. It was Zach Eady and it was Dalton Connect. And Dalton Connect had 37 points. Edie had 40. Dalton Connect, I'm sorry, he missed too many shots. He missed too many open looks. You know, again, 6 for 12 from 3. Put a couple of more of those in there, and those were some clean looks he got. Make a couple more of those, and you win. 14 of 31. Make a couple more of those, and you win. And so when you're the star player, you have the star responsibility. And in that game, Dalton Connect woke up yesterday morning and he knew. He knew that he had to be the best player on the floor yesterday, and he wasn't. And the other thing I didn't like, and again, I don't care about what Dalton Connect does in the NBA. He'll be a high pick, and then as is with all these things, we'll see. You know, there have been guys I've seen in college basketball I thought were going to be great NBA players that ended up not doing much. There have been guys that I was like, who cares about him? And then all of a sudden, Donovan Mitchell's like an eight-time All-Star. So who knows what Dalton Connect's going to do in the NBA? But when Dalton Connect would penetrate yesterday, he was afraid of trying to challenge Edie in the paint. And you're going to say, well, duh, Edie's seven feet tall. Guess what? Every team in the NBA has a seven-foot center. So when Dalton Connect plans on playing in the NBA, is he going to be a spot shooter that just stands in the corner and lets it fly? Or is he going to have to create off the dribble? Because yesterday, I didn't think he did a good enough job of creating off the dribble. And again, 
I thought he had to have one of those unconscious performances yesterday in order to get over the hump of Zach Eady and what might be the best team in the country. I'll take Connecticut, but what might be the best team in the country in Purdue. And those are the three reasons why Tennessee's not in the Final Four. I can sit here today and I can play the, oh, that was such a good game. And, oh, it's such a travesty that one of these teams had to lose. And, oh, you can't take away from Coach Barnes. I think you can because this team should be in the Final Four. And if he'd have called timeout, they might be. But he won't do it. And I thought the officiating was horrendous yesterday. They knew what they were getting themselves into in this game. And, again, you just have to be consistent. They weren't. And again, as much as I'm going to sit here and say, like, hey, 37 points was impressive. And I felt early. I thought Dalton was going to do it because I felt early on like he was about to go off. And 37 points, 37 points. The other guy had 40. The other guy had 40. And that's the difference. And so if you wanted to hear about how great of a game it was, if you wanted to hear about how sad it is that Tennessee didn't win, if you wanted to hear about all that, that's, uh, Tennessee should be in the Final Four. And it sucks they're not. If you're a Tennessee fan, I feel sorry for you because I've been doing this long enough to know there's no guarantee you'll ever have a team that's that good. Memphis had a national championship in their grasp, and they couldn't make their free throws, they've never been back since. Okay? John Thompson III, he got to a Final Four. Georgetown had good players. They had a competitor in 2013, a national championship caliber team. They lost to Florida Gulf Coast, never been back. JT3 is out, and Georgetown has never recovered. The idea that, oh, we'll get back there, I don't know, man. This was a special team. And this was a team that should still be playing. This is a team that should be competing for the national title. And yesterday, quite frankly, they just didn't play very well, and the game wasn't officiated very well, and they didn't coach very well. So that's how we're starting. 615-737-1025 is our phone number, 615-737-1025. And I think it's pretty well known. Like, I'm not a huge Vols fan. Like, I didn't grow up a Vols fan. In fact, I grew up rooting against the Vols and everything else. But, I mean, there is just, there's this just level. I I mean, I I almost think it's embarrassing of people that are just not accepting what happened yesterday. I I mean, it it is wild to me. I want to do that next. 615-737-1025. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063 the game.
Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Uh, coach, just what about the way the game was officiated? How difficult, you know, was it to, I guess, to, to coach your guys on how to de try to defend Edie with the way the game was called? Well, one, you've got a very unique player, Zach Edie, very unique, and uh, it's a hard game to officiate. Um, the space on the court is so important, and. Uh, depending on how a guy gets there and how you try to keep him from getting there and the effort that goes into that uh, oftentimes can get the one guy in particular there out of position where he can maybe help on some other different things. But uh, he, he's an extremely uh, physical player, uh, does a great job uh, wedging with his body. Uh, I, I thought all along uh, his misses are the hardest thing to defend because uh, – you know, he does lead strong when he, he'll, he'll bounce you off and try to create a crack and step through it. That's where he's improved so much with his footwork. But uh, I think it's hard for officials because there's not many guys like that. And uh, it's the game has changed so much through the years. And whether you stay in the lane three seconds or you don't, uh, if you don't ever get out, it really distorts everything. And I'm not saying he did or he didn't, but watching tape, it's a, it, it, he's a difficult guy to officiate. There you go. That was Rick Barnes yesterday after the game. And for the most part, Rick Barnes took the high road about officiating. Now, you did hear at the end of that cut where he's like, now, you know, I don't know if he was in the lane three seconds or whatnot. It, you got to move him out. I was screaming yesterday at the TV. I'm like, three seconds? He just camps out in the lane and they don't call anything. I mean, he's not even trying to get out of the lane. It was unbelievable. So, I was listening to the Midday Show today, and I heard Willie say, you know, there is no way you can argue that the officiating was bad. And I was like, what? So I texted Willie, and I was like, Willie, the officiating was horrendous yesterday. It was inconsistent. You know, they call one thing over here, and then they wouldn't call it over there, and then they'd call. And Willie said to me, he goes, you sound like a UT homer. Well, I think we all know that I'm not a UT homer. So considering that I'm not a Tennessee homer, that I have no problem with the fact that Tennessee lost. I hate it for the fans. I hate it for the players. I have no sympathy for the coach because I thought he did a terrible job yesterday. But I have no sympathy for, you know, I have sympathy for the fans. and I have sympathy for the players. I don't care. No, it doesn't change my life. It's not like it's Louisville. It's not like it's, a you know, the Titans or the Predators or a team that I actively root for. I just thought yesterday, as a basketball fan, I thought the officiating was horrific. And I remember a Super Bowl years ago when I was a kid. I mean, we're talking like middle school or high school. It's weird, these things that I remember in life. Like, I remember where I was when I heard I was at the Jersey Mike's on White Bridge Road, which is still there nowadays. But I was there, and it was Sunday NFL countdown before the Super Bowl. And Torrey Holt was a guest analyst. This was when he was still a wide receiver with the Rams. And Torrey Holt was a guest analyst. And Jeff Fisher was a guest analyst. And they both agreed. They said the only thing that matters about the officiating is that they call it consistently. And that has stuck out, that has stood out to me, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, it has stood out my entire life. You know, look, the strike zone in baseball, it's not going to be perfect. Now, there was a guy on Saturday in the Braves-Phillies game who called a, what would have been a strike three and ended the inning. It was right down the pipe, and he didn't call it. That's a problem. But again, just call your zone consistently. If you're giving the low strike, give it to both pitchers. Football, same way. If we're calling holding and we want to take that, throw the flag. But what you can't do is you can't throw it on one possession and then the next possession let them play. And I thought yesterday that was the problem the officials had. I don't think the officials were like in the bag for Purdue or anything like that. But they were inconsistent. Some of the fouls that they were calling on Awaka, for instance, they were not calling on the other side. I mean, Edie, and I know Edie averages two and a half fouls a game or something like that. Edie fouls, especially going up for rebounds. Now, if we were to say, hey, it's the NCAA tournament, we're going to let those boys bang inside there, we're going to let, we're going to just let it go, fine. I don't have a problem with it. But you can't call a hand check then. 
even if Awaka has the forearm, has the arm bar on him, and he's got the other hand, like, if we're letting him play, you don't call that. If we're going to call it tight, that's fine. But then when Edie pushes somebody under the basket, or he's got J.P. Estrella's arm hooked because Estrella's trying to front the post, you got to call a foul. You got to have it both ways. You cannot let Lawyer hang off of Dalton Connect's shorts as he's coming off of a screen because he gets beat on the play. And I think it is almost ignorance to say that there was not what I believed, and I, what I think many people believe, that there was not inconsistent officiating yesterday that changed the outcome of the game, that truly affected the outcome. And I go back to Awaka's fifth foul. If we want to call it tight, fine, call it a foul. Now, in live time, I didn't see the foul. They showed the replay, and I did see that Awaka's arm was kind of tied under Edie's. And so if you wanted to call a foul, you could have called a foul. But again, we haven't called any of those fouls the entire game of those guys banging in the paint. And then for rebounds. And then we're going to call it on Awaka for his fifth? I, I didn't like it. I didn't think that the, I didn't think that was good officiating. And I think that was kind of a theme throughout the course of the game. And I saw that I want to say it was Grant Ramey tweeted out he uh, covers the Vols for one of those, you know, rah rah fan sites that uh, pretends that they're a serious outlet. Though I don't know Grant, he might be great, I don't know. But he posted a picture during a timeout of Barnes working the official where during the timeout it was Barnes and he was at like the free throw line talking to the official during a timeout. And coming out of that timeout, they called a phantom voodoo call on Dawson, on Dalton Connect. Again, like against uh, um, Purdue, where the guy was defending Connect. And I'm like, the guy didn't even touch Connect. And they called the foul, which means that they were worked over. These officials were worked over that easily by Rick Barnes in that timeout, which means that the very pro Purdue crowd probably affected the officiating yesterday. And I get it. Edie's going to get star calls. He's the star. But we got to at least kind of call it both ways. And I don't think they did that. I mean, I was looking through my Twitter from yesterday and just, you know, some of the some of the things I, I couldn't believe. You know, I'm like, they called a foul on J.P. Estrella, and I put out on Twitter, I'm like, where was that foul on Estrella? Somebody help me get to this foul on J.P. Estrella. Uh there were other ones, right, where I felt like, oh, a moving screen on Edie. Are we going to call that? Nope. They were even on the broadcast. They were like, oh, Edie, they're not going to call it. It's like, if we're going to call it tight, if we're going to call the arm bar in the hand check, then we have got to call a moving screen. And they didn't. And I just think, again, there's something about basketball, like college basketball, that the college basketball writers of America – who cover this sport in November and December and January when we're all paying attention to football, that these people feel like they are the utmost authority on what we're allowed to view when watching March Madness because they watch it much larger than we do, right? Like they know more about Kevin Keats at NC State than we do because they know more about NC State because some of us didn't even know NC State had a basketball program until a week ago. But at the same time, there's kind of this pompous arrogance that's like, it wasn't bad officiating. I'm like, did you watch a game? Because I watch a game. And I, again, it was so inconsistent. And I think the Vol fans should be upset about that. Again, I am not a UT homer. And for 30 years of my life, I'm 34 right now. For 30 years of my life, I have heard Tennessee volunteer fans call in after football and basketball games and complain about officiating my entire life. In fact, I joke about it. All the refs, they're cheating us. This is the one time where I think Tennessee has a rightful gripe, and I think they got screwed by the officials and how inconsistent they called it and how they let Zach Eady get away with murder in the paint. They let the guards put their hands everywhere. And don't even get me started. I must have been the only person in America that noticed this yesterday. Did you notice when the Purdue guards caught the ball? That, you know, they pass out of the post. They throw it back to the guard. All these guards shot fake and then drive, right? Because the whole point is to shot fake, drive. Guy comes over to help and they dump it off to Eady for a dunk. So they shot fake and they drive. 
Well, these Purdue guards are kicking their feet, both of them, every time they go for that shot fake. That's a walk. Now, it's not a walk in the NBA, but this isn't the NBA. But I have noticed this over the years, that we are getting further and further away from actually calling that penalty in college basketball, whereas the NBA gave up on it years ago. I watched the UConn game. I don't know if you guys saw this. The UConn game, Stan Van Gundy's doing it. And the guy from Connecticut drives, he gets bumped, they call the foul, puts the shot up, it goes in, and Van Gundy's like, we have got to add the continuation in college basketball, that bucket should count. No, I don't want guys getting fouled at the three-point line and saying that a drive to the paint counts. No, but that's a different discussion. Again, I thought the officiating was horrible, and if anybody tells you otherwise, I, I just, I think that they're just, They're finger-wagging you because this is college basketball and you Tennessee fans need to accept what happened. I'm like, look, I mean, they're not going to redo the game, but Tennessee got screwed. 615-737-1025. we got a bunch of your phones to get to, so we'll do it. 615-737-1025. Zach Eady said something after the game yesterday that I guess Tennessee fans got mad about. We'll get to that next. 615-737-1025 is our phone number again broadcasting live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. Uh, By the way, if your bracket's all screwed up, we have the ability for you to still win because we've got the four-team bracket challenge. (laughs) You gone. Go to thegamenashville.com slash bracket challenge and fill out your four-team bracket challenge to compete to win prizes, including tickets to see Creed at Ascend Amphitheater on August 13th. The 1025 The Game Bracket Challenge is brought to you by ESPN Bet Sportsbook, Twin Peaks, and Volunteer Hose and Gasket.
What does it mean? I mean, you gave the, the, the net to Coach Katie. What does it mean to get Coach Painter to the Final Four? Uh, it's amazing. Like I get to, I get to pay him back. Like there was, there were so many coaches that that looked over me. Um, like you could name a program, I can name a coach that looked over me. Um, the Tennessee, Greg Barnes is a great coach, but he he was in a bunch of our practice, looked over me. Like it, it's kind of been the story of my life. People have doubted me. People look past me and can't do that anymore. So that Zach Eady comment yesterday had a lot of Tennessee fans online upset. They were like, how dare you throw Rick Barnes under the bus? Just celebrate your win. You don't have to do that. Let me say this, folks. You walk the walk, you can talk the talk. And Zach Eady had 40 points. Now, the officiating, again, I thought was horrendous. But Zach Eady had 40 points. Zach Eady's in the Final Four. Zach Eady, when he was doing that interview, had the net around his neck. You can talk the talk if you can walk the walk. And yesterday, Purdue did. I bet Zach Eady wouldn't have that same tune if Tennessee had called timeout at one point during that end of the first half run. But nope, they didn't. And Purdue won. And Purdue can talk. Phone lines driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Adam in Portland is going to kick us off today on the Elite Eight. Thank you for calling. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I don't I don't share your sentiment when it comes to them getting hosed on officiating. I knew it was going to be a tough game. Well, the problem I have with that game is that the, coming into it, it was going to be either it's Dalton Connect and then he's going to need help. And that was going to have to come from Vescovi and from Adu, and I thought they were just gone. Like, I, I know Vescovi was, I guess, had the flu or something the game before, but those two guys, like, where were they? They're, they're an important piece. I thought Jordan James came out of nowhere and played his butt off. I feel bad for him, but, like, I expected those two to do a lot more than what they did. So here's the crazy part about it. Who was the second-best player on the floor for Tennessee yesterday, in your opinion, Adam? Uh, Let's see. Probably Jordan James. So I would argue that the second-best player – thank you, Adam. I would argue that the second-best player was Ganey. And Ganey hit two threes, had a massive steal that got Tennessee right back in the game that led to a Dalton Connect dunk. So if your best players, if the guys who play at the best of their ability in an Elite Eight game are Dalton Connect, Jordan Ganey, and J.P. Estrella, you've got problems. And so, uh, again, those guys, Vescovy and Josiah Jordan-James and... uh, even to a certain extent, Zakai Ziegler. Now, Ziegler kind of is in the, hey, man, you know, it's different in college. I don't know how much these kids make now that they are getting paid. But this is, hey, man, you got to pay what you owe here. Ziegler is kind of in that class. But to me, this is about the star versus the star. I don't look at Purdue and say, you know what? Purdue got there because Lawler made a couple, lawyer made a couple of nice plays down the stretch that put them. Purdue's there because of Zach Eady. And Tennessee's not there because Zach Eady had 40, Dalton Connect had 37. There you go. Now, the one thing that I, I think I am a little disappointed with is my game plan, if I was Tennessee, I think it's you're right not to double the post, which is everybody wants to do it, right? Deny the ball into the post, force Eady to go the other way, and then once it gets in there, clamp down on the post. The problem is, is that you do that, Eady's going to kick it out to a shooter. What I would have done if I was Tennessee is I would have played in front of Edie and forced him to the side with which he wants to post up on that left block. So move him to the other side. So he's got to post up over there. And then once he does, let him catch the ball. And I was texting with, uh, with a, my old high school coach, and I said that I would let Edie, I would just man up Edie. Tell Adu, Awaka, Estrella, just Get in front. Once he catches, get your hands up. But, I mean, he's probably going to score. And my high school coach said, well, you do that. You let Edie get his. He may get 40. I said, I know. But I can score 60. If Edie scores 30 and everybody else, because I'm doubling down in the post or I'm trying to rake and grab the ball or something like that, if Edie's throwing out of the post and everybody, he's got 15, he's got 15, he's got 15, I lose. And so I would let Edie get his. And I'd make all the other guys spectators. 
And then if I'm Tennessee, I try to win on the other end because when I shoot, I'm shooting for three. They're shooting for two. I'm shooting for three. I also wish that Rick Barnes had gone to Ganey earlier in the game. And then once it was obvious that he was having a, you know, that he was on, they really needed to say, hey, if this ball doesn't go to Dalton, it needs to go to Jordan Ganey as far as shooting the ball from the perimeter. And instead, I mean, they, there's a timeout, and coming out of the timeout, they draw up an elbow jumper for Josiah Jordan James. Or at least that's what ended up happening if they didn't draw it up. Ben in Cumberland City says, Jared, come on, man. You sound like the rest of the whiny Tennessee fan base crying about everything. The national media hates us. The refs hate us. It's such a worn-out attitude Anytime. Tennessee's team loses, there's a conspiracy behind it. I didn't give you a conspiracy. I just told you the game was called inconsistently, and it was bad. But again, this is the point. You're saying I sound like all these whiny Tennessee fans. Well, you know that I'm not a whiny Tennessee fan. If you've listened to this show for any length of time, you know that I am not Chad Withrow. So if you know that I'm not a ball homer, that I don't live and die by UT, that, again, I didn't have a hard time sleeping last night after that game. I'm sure there were some UT fans that were all excited about their trips to Phoenix that were. So if you haven't been listening long enough to know that I don't do that, especially when it comes to the Vols, then that's on you. But to just disagree with something or to not like Tennessee fans and thus say the claims of horrendous officiating yesterday are invalid just because Tennessee fans always complain, I think it just actually tells me more about you and how much you don't like Tennessee fans complaining. And I don't like Tennessee fans complaining either. I've dealt with it my entire life. But this is different. I mean, this, to me, there is substance to this. Gary says, too many missed mid-range jumpers did they hit more than two of those yesterday? Texture says, I'd drop 40 if I got 952 free throws. I, again, I'm fine with calling it tight. You know, the NCAA tournament, back when Cal used to win games in the NCAA tournament, Cal had a theory. He never liked playing zone. And people would say, why don't you play zone? And Cal Perry would say that he wouldn't play zone because what they call – in the regular season, you know, when they start calling hand checks and body bumps and things like that, they're not going to call it the NCAA tournament. So I'm not going to coach them to play a certain way during the regular season, knowing that we're going to throw that out the window come the NCAA tournament. So what I guess I'm saying is, like, if you want to call it tight, again, I'm not used to that in the tournament, you can call it tight. But you got to call it tight on both sides. And you can't be selective with how tight you are. You can't have them battling under the basket and shoving everybody out of the way and not calling a foul on Edie. And then all of a sudden, you know, Awaka gets tangled up with Edie at the end and now it's the fifth foul. I mean, just, I just thought it was unbelievable. One texture says, as a Tennessee fan, this wasn't a Tennessee versus the refs problem. Zach Eady has gotten this treatment the entire year, and I've yet to see a national media member call it out. You're telling me in a physical game, every single player that was on the court got called for a foul in the first half except for the biggest guy on the court. It makes it impossible to watch. Let me say this about my assumptions of the basketball bennies out there when it comes to the, you know, again, the Bennies are, oh, you don't understand. You guys are just complaining about officiating. This isn't. These guys are turned into the baseball writers. You know, the baseball writers just think that baseball is holier than that. Like Jason Stark. You know, you said to Jason Stark something like, hey, you know that a lot of people don't care about baseball as much as they used to? <gasps> How dare you say that about America's national pastime? You know, that's how the baseball writers are. <gasps> how dare you suggest that we let Barry Bonds into the Hall of Fame? You know, that kind of thing. Basketball writers are kind of like that, too. Like, they're, they're, they're kind of like that, too. The Jeff Goodmans, the Matt Norlanders, the Dana O'Neills, you know, the people that Rex Road goes out to dinner with when he goes on the road for games like this. Those people. 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in 615-737-1025 here on the program and 
I don't. I mean, I, <laughs> I really wanted there to be a different outcome, but it just, it is what it is. And there's no way of getting around it. And I'm going to tell you what that is next. And we'll do that here on Stillman and Company, 615-737-1025. The Predators, by the way, back in action tomorrow. They're taking on the uh, the Bruins. And tomorrow is your opportunity to participate in Preds Pick to Click. That's right. Preds Pick to Click is brought to you by TJ Anderson Homes of Benchmark Realty. That's my real estate agent. Get your home seen, heard, and sold with TJ. But if you correctly guess a Preds player that scores a goal in the game tomorrow night, you win a pair of Tickets to an upcoming Preds home game. Participate with Robbie and Retro tomorrow morning at 8.45 a.m. Pick to Click is brought to you by T.J. Anderson Homes of Benchmark Realty. List your home with T.J. to get your home seen, heard, and sold. Connect for three. And Edie with the rebound. Lance Jones got away with one there because that was going to be an open shot. You got to fight over those screens big time against this guy. This is the 28th time this year Purdue has had a run of at least 10-0 or more. 
And now it's 12 in a row for the Boilermakers. Every time they're in the half court, something good happens. Again, I wish I could make it the outcome different for them, but uh, the fact that God's blessed me with the time I've had with these guys is something that I wish every coach could enjoy. I wish there was something I could do about this. There is. You build a time machine, you go back an hour, and you call timeout when you have an 11-point lead. Purdue calls timeout, and then you give up a 12-0 run, and all of a sudden you're going into the break trailing when, again, you had an 11-point lead and really had Purdue on the ropes. One texture says, Joe is going to rip you a new one for blaming Rick Barnes. Let me just say this. I was rooting for Rick Barnes. I like Rick Barnes. I do. I think Rick Barnes is a good coach. I have said this for years. I think he's the perfect coach for Tennessee basketball because he will give you an interesting January. If you're a Vol fan, football season is over in December, and he'll give you an interesting December, January, February, and March. Then they'll crap out in the tournament, and everybody will be upset for a day, and then you'll go on about your life, and you'll move over to baseball. It happens all the time. He's a good coach. And you could do a lot worse than Rick Barnes. But I did not think Rick Barnes coached a very good game yesterday. Number one, I didn't like the game plan. I already told you. I would have let Edie get his, and I would have made all the other guys beat me. Purdue would have been shocked by this game plan of, we're going to deny it into the post, but we're not going to challenge Edie too much. We're going to go straight up, you know, maybe try to block a shot early before guys get in foul trouble, something like that. But what we're really not letting you do is we're not letting Edie throw the ball out of the post. Then the guards start to get impatient because even though Edie's the star player, they want their shots now. They start to get impatient. And again, it's simple math. I'm going to score 60. Edie can't score 60 in a game. So if he tries, he gets to 54, but nobody else scores, I win. So I didn't like that. Number two, I did not like how he wouldn't call timeout, you know, when Purdue went on that run. And I think that's the number one thing that probably cost Tennessee the game outside of the officiating. Again, I know he doesn't do it. It doesn't mean that it's good. Every other coach in America, including the coach that you played against yesterday, called timeout. Rick Barnes won't do it. I did not like plays they drew up out of the timeout. Too often I felt like Tennessee settled for a jump shot out of a timeout that was not a high percentage look or was not a wide open Dalton connect three or it was drawn up for Ziegler or Josiah Jordan James shooting an elbow jumper. I'm like, where did we come up with this play? And again, when you're coming out of the timeout, that's a play that the coach draws up. Didn't like that. I did not like how long it took him to get Jordan Ganey in the game, realizing that Ganey was having a good game when Vescovy was not. I didn't like that. I thought that Ganey was probably against Purdue from a defensive standpoint and the fact that he hit a couple of jump shots. I thought Ganey was probably the best changeup that they had that could have thrown Purdue off a little bit. They just didn't use him very much until the very end of the game. And I did not like when he came back with a walk-up. He came back with a walk-up with about five minutes to go. My rule of thumb is this. You have to put a guy with four fouls back in the game if the game is going to get out of hand without him in it. That's how I view it. So if you are going to lose the game, if this player's not in, let's use Steph Curry at Davidson as the example. A one-man team. If Steph Curry has four fouls and it is a two-point game, Steph's on the bench. If Steph has four fouls, And all of a sudden, it's starting to get to 7, 8, 10, where if I don't come back with Steph right now, it's not going to matter. If Steph's available for the final three minutes, Steph goes back in the game. When he decided to go back with Awaka at the five-minute mark, Estrella was actually doing a pretty good job. And so at that point, I'm like, you can take it to the under four timeout of the second half, which is then when, hey, if you got four fouls, you got to play. And he didn't do that, and immediately a walker got popped with number five. I just didn't like it. So you can say Joe will get mad at me. I'm sure he will. But I just didn't think that – I just didn't think that Barnes coached a very good game yesterday. One texture says, 
When the only player on your team scores in double digits, when only one player on your team scores in double digits, it makes it harder to win. The rest of the team just did not help Dal- uh, Dalton connect. I would disagree. I mean, I think Ganey did his job. I think Estrella did his job. Other than that, I see what you're saying. Ziegler I mean, had probably a bad needed, game. What's that? Ziegler. I was going to say, they needed better out of Ziegler. Yeah, he, that was the one he where he had open shots. shots and Adu he, missed too many open shots. Adu sucks. He was He's too soft for games like that. I'm really disappointed because I felt like... I really felt like Adu at the end of the regular season was coming on. And Adu was terrible in the SEC tournament. He was terrible Against in the Creighton Sweet 16 too. game. Yes, he was terrible Friday night, and he was terrible yesterday. I hope he's getting NIL money because I hate saying that college players suck. But if you're getting paid, then it's part of the deal. I'm sure he's getting some NIL money. Kyle in Shelbyville says, can we just agree that two great teams went to battle and one had to lose and one had to win? No! No! That's the That, to me, is the cop-out. Well, it was a great game, and somebody had to win, and somebody had to lose, and somebody had to not call timeout. And somebody was drawing up plays for Josiah Jordan James to shoot from the elbow. And somebody had their post players get about 25 fouls when the other team's post player got one or two fouls. What it does is it ignores what happened and just allows us to dismiss it as if it's just nothing. Kind of like that NCAA women's game. Did you see that yesterday, Ian, where the three-point line was different on the two ends of the floor? No, I didn't see that. So in the NC State-Texas women's game, Wes Moore, who should be the next head coach at Tennessee, and, and honestly, to me, when I saw Kelly Harper was getting fired, I'm like, they're, they that is for Wes Moore. I'll be stunned if they don't hire Wes Moore at NC State. But before NC State played uh, Texas in the women's Elite Eight, the two coaches – looked and saw, noticed that the three-point line was different on one side of the floor than it was the other side. So they did, you know, what you normally do where you count your steps, and they realized it was off. They brought out the measuring tape, and the NCAA measured it and saw that it was off. And both coaches just agreed to play on it anyways. I'm like, how does that happen? And no, I'm just not going to ignore stuff like that when it happens and say, oh, well, you know, it was a great game, and somebody had to win, and somebody had to lose. No. No. We're not doing that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Field Yates at ESPN. He's got a little football experience. Used to work for teams. Smart guy. We had Field on at the Super Bowl. I thought it was one of the best and most informative interviews that we did. So Field has updated his big board. And I trust this stuff because I know Field knows players. And so he's got a couple of things in here that I'm keeping my eye on. We'll get to that coming up next here on Stillman and Company on 1025-1063 The Game. Hey, score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the the 10,000 Power Play Giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company Home Services. That's right, a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company Home Services. Go online to leecompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway in the 10K Power Play Giveaway. Contest entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th. Lee Company.
Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live in the Springdale Heating and, excuse me, that will not happen again. We are live from our friends at the Busy Bee Plumbing and Air Conditioning Studios. Busy Bee? The Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Studios. We're very, very excited that our friends at Busy Bee Plumbing are with us on this. We love you, Busy Bee. Mwah, I love you. And uh, that won't happen again. Anywho, so uh, Field Yates put out his updated big board. Now, I don't know how much you guys, you know, value this draft guy or that draft guy. One time I was at Barrel House when the Midday Show was on, and they were talking about, I don't know what it was, Drake May maybe. And they were like, well, Mel Kuyper says this, but Tim Hasselbeck says that. And Willie just goes, well, I mean, I care a lot more about what Tim has to say than I do about what Mel Kuyper says. And I laughed out loud. I was like, yeah, you know, make a point there. But we had Field on at the Super Bowl. And I know that Field has worked in the NFL. He worked with the Patriots in the front office for a while. And Field's a really bright dude. After we had him on at the Super Bowl, there were so many texts into the text line that people that were like, man, this guy knows what he's talking about. So when I see that ESPN has Field Yates top 50 updated, I immediately this morning ran by to click it. I was like, I got to see this. And then I was thinking, okay, what are kind of the headlines from this? The first is Field Yates ranks Joe Alt as the seventh best player in the draft. He's got three quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels, and three wide receivers, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze, ahead of all. And that's fine. And it kind of falls in line with my main thinking of this draft, which is I think that there are probably seven elite prospects in this draft. I think there's a lot of first-round players. Like Amarius Mims out of Georgia, who is not a finished product, is a legitimate first-round player, and he'll still probably be on the board at 18 or 19. That means it's a deep draft. Most drafts have about 16 first-round prospects in them. I think this draft has seven, you know, elite prospects in them. Caleb Williams, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., Joe Alt, Jaden Daniels, Brock Bowers, and Drake May. And I am, a, I am a believer in Drake May. The more I've thought about it, the more I've decided, like, I like I'm not going to let the fact that, well, this draft analyst doesn't like draft. I'm not going to let that. I think it's got about seven elite prospects. And clearly, Field has Alt there at seven, which means that if you were to take Alt with the seventh pick, it would not be a reach, which is important to note. The second thing Field has in there that I noticed was three tackles reside in the top 14 between 12 and 14. So at 12, he has J.C. Latham. At 13, he has Troy Fautanu. And at 14, he has Olu Fashnu. What does that mean? I think it means that the Titans, if they were to trade out, and I still have a hard time on this J.J. McCarthy front, I still have a hard time thinking that Minnesota's really going to trade up to four or trade up to five in order to get J.J. when he's probably not one of the elite players of this draft, which means that a trade up to seven is a lot more likely. Again, I've thrown out this proposed trade, which is 7, 22, and 108 to the Titans. No, excuse me. 11, 23, and 108 to the Titans in exchange for a, for 7 and 38. And a lot of you were like, oh, I don't want to give up 38, Jared. I'm like, that's why they're trading with you, and they're not trading with Arizona. Because if they're just going to give it the two first-round picks and not get 38 back, they just trade with Arizona, get to four, and get J.J. But again, if you trade out of that pick, you lose what seems like a certainty that Joe Alt will be available with that pick, which means you'd have to take one of the second tackles. But if you're trading back to 11, and Latham, Fawatanu, and Fashnu are all there, and they're similarly graded, like Field Yates has them graded, then you can very much get your starting left tackle with that same pick that you were going to use, and you get that 108, plus you get that other higher pick than 38. And here's the other one that kind of stood out to me. J.J. McCarthy at 21 on Field Yates' big board. Look, Field Yates isn't the greatest talent evaluator of all time. 
And we should note the uncertainty of the quarterback position. Bill Walsh came out before the 96 draft. Excuse me, the 93 draft. Bill Walsh came out before the 93 draft, and he said that Rick Meyer was the next Joe Montana. So even the smartest coach maybe of all time, they get it wrong. But Field has J.J. at 21. Here's my question to everybody. Can you really draft the 21st best player with the fourth pick? Mel's big board that came out last week has J.J. McCarthy at 14. So if J.J. is the 14th best player in one, he's the 21st best player in another, Chances are J.J. McCarthy is probably somewhere around the 12th to 25th best prospect in this draft. So let's stick that right in the middle at 18 or 19. You can't draft the 18th or the 17th best player in a draft with the fourth overall pick. You can't trade two first rounders to move up to take the 14th best player or the 21st best player in a draft. Which, again, I think now makes it more likely that Minnesota is probably looking at Tennessee at seven as the opportunity to grab McCarthy because Denver doesn't have two first-round picks they can deal with to jump them. But Denver doesn't need two first-round picks to get from 12 to nine with Chicago. They probably do in order to make the kind of trade with Minnesota or with Tennessee that Minnesota could make. So I just found that fascinating when I looked at Fields' big board, and I saw that, hey, all seventh best player, which means that if you take him with the seventh pick, you're fine. You're not reaching at that point. Elite level prospect. Three tackles, 12 through 14, Latham, Falatanu, and Fashnu, which means you could trade down. And then J.J. McCarthy at 21 How can this J.J. hype be real if he's really the 21st best player? Also, Field had three tackles in the top 30. Fuaga at 17, Guyton out of Oklahoma at 24, and Mims out of Georgia at 26. So if we keep talking about this hypothetical J.J. McCarthy trade with Minnesota, what you're doing is you're going to allow yourself to take your second tackle because those guys should still be on the board there where they won't be on the board come 38, most likely. 615-737-1025 is the phone number 615-737-1025 we'll get to your phones on that plus one name keeps climbing up the gurus draft boards and it very much has to do with the titans and it very much has a decision the titans had to make last year attached to it we'll do that coming up next again we are broadcasting live from the busy bee plumbing heating, and air conditioning game, Nashville Studios. And uh, let me tell all the fine folks out there that tomorrow, or excuse me, Wednesday, is your opportunity to come check out Smashville Live, the Predators Player Show at Brewhouse South in Cool Springs at 6 o'clock. See your Predators star players up close and personal, plus get autographs and pictures. And this week's special guests are Spencer Stasny and Mark Jankowski. My guy, Ian, who had a goal the other day, by the way. Expect to see you there after the show. I mean, Jankowski, well, I'm getting my puppy that day, so I don't think I'll be doing that. Smashville Live is brought to you by the Black Abbey Brewing Company and ESPN Vet Sportsbook.
at the Washington Pro Day. Roma Dunze stood on his times from the Combine. They were outstanding. Why bother? If it wasn't broken, don't fix it. Uh, and the two offensive tackles, Mel, nothing that you and I haven't talked about already in our evaluations of Troy Fatutanu and also Roger Rosengarten. Uh, and obviously we've watched plenty of tape on those two players, but it is a sight to be seen watching these two men move in space. They are not your average offensive tackles athletically. We think Fautanu is a lock in the first round. We think Rosengarten is a lock to go in the first two rounds. And they certainly look the part there in Seattle on Thursday. Those two men can move. They are incredibly fluid. Let me just say, there is just a bunch of rock star humans at that Washington football program. I don't know that you can collectively measure football character, but it had to be very close to the top of the NCAA last year. Okay, Field Yates talking about the Washington Pro Day. And the one name that he mentioned that I want to highlight here is Troy Fawatanu. Because it feels like Troy Fawatanu is skyrocketing up these draft boards. We talked about how Mel Kuyper has Joe Walt on his big board as the eighth best player. He has Fawatanu on his big board as the ninth best player. Field has Fawatanu as the 13th best player on his board. But it was funny because I was talking about Fawatanu on Friday. And Robbie Stanley texted me and goes, oh, great, another guard. And that is the one kind of knock on Fawatanu is that he's got that same Peter Skaronsky question when it comes to is he a guard or is he a tackle. Now, he's got arms that are two inches longer than Skaronsky's, and whenever it comes to why can't Peter Skaronsky play tackle, all anybody ever tells me is it's his arm length. So here's what Field Yates wrote at ESPN about Troy Falatanu. He says, quote, Falatanu spent the past two seasons as the front side protector for Michael Penix Jr., though he might wind up settling at guard in the NFL. Field writes, I would play him at left tackle, though. Wherever he plays, his footwork and competitive spirit give him a chance to be a star. Concerns about length, which prompted the chatter of moving to guard, were assaged at the combine when he measured in with a 34-and-a-half-inch arm. So a couple things on Faltanu. First, yes, he played left tackle, but we need to remember that Michael Penix is left-handed. So, why does that matter? J.C. Latham, we talk about him at Alabama, and how maybe the Titans draft J.C. Latham, and they decide to do what Bill Callahan did in Cleveland with Jedrick Wills, which was move him from right tackle over to left tackle. The problem with that is, when Jedrick Wills played right tackle at Alabama, Tua was the starting quarterback there, and Tua is left-handed. Penix is left-handed. So let's keep that in mind, which might be, you know, a positive for Rosengartner, the other guy. But again, we're talking about left left tackle for a right-handed quarterback. The second thing is if there's a question about whether or not Faltanu's a guard or a tackle, Bill Callahan better say, I'm playing him at left tackle. I know he can play left tackle. I'm not worried about him and his arms or his length or his butt or his shins or I I don't, I, whatever. Because if you draft him and it's uh well we don't know if he's going to be a we don't know if he's going to be a guard or a tackle you can't do that because you've already done that you already have one player on your team who is that well is he a guard or is he a tackle and then you spent a whole year trying to figure that out and you also can't suck so bad in back to back years that you draft guards in the first round because the last thing you want to do is draft Skaronsky 2.0. But then the, the final question on Falatanu is, what's the drop-off between him and Alt? Mel says it's not that big. That the difference between Alt and Falatanu is the eighth best player in the draft compared to the ninth best player. Field says it's the seventh best player to the 13th best player. Well, what does that mean? Because, again, moving from 7 to 11 or 7 to 12 or 7 to whatever – could mean a lot in terms of the picks and things that you may be able to acquire. And thus, it's like, well, if it's not that big of a drop-off from Alt to Faltanu, make the move. If it's not that big of a drop from Alt to Fashnu, which it feels like it is, make the move. But if not, then just take Alt and be done with it. Phone lines driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com at 615-737-1025. Kyle has been waiting patiently and is up next here on the Titans. Thank you for calling. What's up, Kyle? 
Hey, Jared. Andy, and uh, I, I'm so out on that trade up to four. I can't even imagine that. Like, that's just make-believe stuff. Uh, for on whatever. somebody trading up to four for J.J. McCarthy? Well, the Titans maybe trading up to get Joe Alt and all that, too. Or Who's something. saying that's, they're going to do that? That's been rumored. Anywho, I, I would be okay if Joe Alt is still there and say, like, the Raiders are offering you their first and second pick, wouldn't you just want to trade back and get Mims from Georgia? We've got Bill Callahan. They say this guy has just as much talent as any left tackle in this draft. Best left tackle coach or line coach in the game. I think that's perfect. Get you an extra second-round pick that can get you right tackle and that defensive pass rusher you need. I, I'm, I'm in for that. I, I love Joe Alt, but – if Troy or Mims is good as they say they can be, let's go. Well, I think the difference, though, is that Alt has started 34 consecutive games at left tackle, and I think Mims has started like eight games in his career. That's true, but, you know, Bill can teach him, man. I believe in him. He, he took Darnold, Darwin Jones from uh, Ohio State. DeJuan Jones. To right. Yeah, and look at what he's doing, man. So Right, shoot. but DeJuan Jones didn't get in there. Thank you for your call. Dewan Jones, first of all, Dewan Jones fell from the second round to the third round because there were concerns that he was lazy. Like, that's what happened. I mean, he weighed in at the combine and was like 380-something. And then he wouldn't weigh in at pro day. What's that tell you? So NFL teams got spooked and thought, well, he's probably 400 pounds, 415 pounds or something like that. They probably thought he was a lazy fat ass. That's probably what happened. And so that's why he fell a little bit. Secondly, Dewan Jones didn't have to go in until later in the year. And when we're talking about drafting a Marius Mims, who doesn't have a lot of experience, we're not talking about drafting a Marius Mims and keeping him on the bench until November. We're talking about drafting a Marius Mims and him starting week one. And I don't, there's a big difference between the two. And so, I mean, to me, like Mims, I'm, I'm skeptical on Mims because of the experience. The thing about Alt, what it feels like to me, is that when it comes to Joe Alt, you're getting the sure thing, right? Think of this like a coaching search, right? We are a college football program, and we are looking for the next head coach at Jared Stillman State University. In this case, the Titans are looking for their next franchise left tackle to follow Taylor Lewan, Michael Roos, Brad Hopkins, Mike Munchak. Alt is the surest thing. Everybody else has some sort of massive question. Faltanu, is he a tackle? Is he a guard? I don't know. Latham, can he move from the right side to the left side? Mims, doesn't have a lot of experience, got hurt at the combine, got hurt at pro day. Fashnu, got the baby hand. Everybody else has some sort of question mark around them except for Alt. So, again, if this were a coaching search and we were Jared Stillman State University and we had two different coaches, we could say, okay, we can pay $9 million for Nick Saban. And we know we're going to win with Nick Saban. Or we could hire the guy at Lafayette State who has just reeled off like, three straight seasons where they're really good and he's the next great up-and-coming coach. But we'll have to pay him three million bucks. That's the difference here, in my opinion. 615-737-1025, more your phones. 615-737-1025, though there is a little nugget about Field Yates' board. That actually shapes up pretty well for the Titans. We'll do that coming up next here on our program. Twice daily. I was at twice daily yesterday. I went to boxing, and then after boxing, I was like, it is Sunday. I want a bagel. So I went right to the kiosk, and I ordered a turkey bagel with honey mustard and two egg whites. And it was 
fabulous. Oh, my goodness. Twice Daily has all of your cravings, too, and you can save on every visit. So stop in and get rewarded. All you need to do is join the Twice Daily Rewards program to unlock special discount savings and enter their sweepstakes and so much more. Try their new wraps like the Italian ham and cheddar, turkey and Swiss, and their Nashville hot chicken. They're made to order with your favorite toppings, and when you download the Twice Daily app, You can order ahead. Or at Twice Daily, it's snack time all the time. And they've got your favorites like chicken fingers, tater rounds, and the brand making new pretzels. Twice Daily, what are you craving? You mentioned the idea of trading from like 7 to 14. There, to me, are definitely 100% high-level tackle prospects that should be there at pick number 14. Olu Fashanu from Penn State could be there. Tyler Guyton, an offensive tackle from Oklahoma, could still be there. Marius Mims, an offensive tackle from Georgia. Uh, He and Guyton might need a little bit of time, but uh, if you saw them walking around this room, and you and I are in a room right now that's got a ton of current and former athletes Mm -hmm. who, you know, are sort of like, you know, built from... 
you know, like they look like gods. Uh, those two right there, Tyler Guyton and Marius Mims, are like they, they arrived from offensive line factory. Like they are born to be offensive tackles. They're huge, imposing, very gifted players, just need a little bit more experience. Those guys are going to be available at 14. There you go. That was Field Yates on our show at the Super Bowl talking about, hey, you know, you trade back, you'll still be able to get a tackle. But one thing that Field did caution us on at the Super Bowl was, hey, there are a lot of teams that are good teams that need tackles. Dallas needs a tackle. Cincinnati needs a tackle. Kansas City needs a tackle. There are good teams that need tackles. So, again, Field Yates put out his top 50, his big board today. And as much as we could talk about the top and seven and alt and everything else, Field's board is stacking up very nicely for the Titans at 38. Here are the picks from 33 to 42, and I took out a couple of positions that I don't necessarily think the Titans will go after. So at 33, he's got Jordan Morgan, the right tackle from Arizona. At 34, he's got Edgerin Cooper, the inside linebacker at Texas A&M. You could use a right tackle. You could use an inside backer, though I am nervous about the idea of an inside backer wearing the green dot who's a rookie. At 36 on Fields' big board, he has Lad McConkey, the receiver out of Georgia. At 38, which is where you're picking, Ricky Pearsall, the wide receiver out of Florida, is on Field Yates' big board. And again, I think we can say that receiver is still somewhat of a need. Xavier Worthy at 39, Keon Coleman at 42. Now, Worthy is the speed guy, and because he ran a 4-2-1 at the Combine, everybody thinks Kansas City will take him at 32. There might be another reason, by the way, why Kansas City takes him at 32. Did you see what Rasheed Rice did over the weekend? Heard about that, yeah. Woof! So, but again, he's got him at 39, and he's got Keon Coleman, who TD swears by Keon Coleman. He ran a 4-6 at the Combine. He was very productive at Florida State. You know, kind of more of the big body catches the ball, like the running back receiver type receiver is kind of more Keon Coleman's game. And he's at 42. So, again, we're talking about 38. You can pick the 42nd best player with the 38th pick. He's also got on field's big board, which, again, we talk about trading down out of seven. We never talk about trading down out of 38. But he's got two tackles, Kingsley Suamataya out of BYU at 45. And then he's got Peyton Wilson, the inside backer, who, again, TD raves about out of NC State, and we played NC State this year, Louisville did, and he was making every play on the field. And they have him at 46. So again, in theory, at 38, you could trade out. Now, I'm not going to say 38's as important as 7, but 38, given the amount of holes that this team has, 38 is pretty damn important. And Fields Board shakes up very nicely for what the Titans could or could not want. One texter says, Jared, on the topic of the Titans trading back in the draft, do we trust Rand Carthon with the extra picks that the Titans would get in return? It's pretty hard to screw up a top seven pick, although he did draft a guard at pick 11 last year. It's much easier to screw up the mid to late first round and everything thereafter. In my opinion, texter says, we should stick with quality over quantity. That decreases the chances that Ran and Chad Brinker end up bombing the draft by trying to act like the smartest guys in the room, mansplaining analytics to us as they reach on a bunch of mid-first-round picks. Who wrote this email? I mean, this uh, text. Sounds like a soul after my heart. (laughs) You know, I mean, it's banging on Ran. I mean, let me just say this. And I've said this for a long time. I want Ran to be successful. You know, I saw Matt Jones say this. Matt Jones at Kentucky Sports Radio, he thinks Calipari and Kentucky should break up. But then when it was announced that Calipari would be returning, he says he's rooting for Calipari. I believe him. He says, look, just because it's not my way doesn't mean that I don't want what's best for Kentucky. I feel the same way about the Titans. I want Rand to be successful. I have said this about John Robinson, and I'll say this about Rand Carthon, which is people used to text into the text line and say, well, who cares about the picks anyways? Let's just go try to trade them and get players because we don't pick good players anyways, Jared. And to everybody that would say that, I'd say, if you don't think your general manager can pick players, you need to fire your general manager. So if you're in the position that Amy's in, 
of deciding. You know, they're going to run these decisions by her. She's the owner. And they say, well, Amy, we really like this idea. You know, the drop-off between Alt at 7 and Fawatanu or uh, Fashnu at 14 or at 11 is this. And the extra picks we'll get are this and this. And we think we should do it. Amy should say yes. And then should expect Rand to hit on those picks. Now, the thing about the draft is you're not going to, at any point, you're not going to hit on every draft choice. One of these second rounders that they could acquire, if they acquire an extra second rounder, could be a total bust. A John Robinson drafted Kevin Dodd and Derrick Henry in the same second round. So he's not going to hit on all of them. And it would be unreasonable to expect Rand to hit on all of these. But as long as Rand is the general manager, I think that the Titans have to have faith that if Rand thinks that a trade out out of seven and the drop off from Alt to Fashnu or the drop off from Alt to Faltanu or Mims or Jordan Morgan or whoever, if he thinks that that drop off is an, is not large enough to stop him from acquiring the other picks, then go ahead and let him. And if he fails, fire him. So I'm not going to say, no, 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 don't trade back because I don't trust you to make those picks because if that's the way you feel, then you should fire your general manager. Just like I told you guys last year when we talked about quarterbacks and you guys kept texting in saying, what makes you believe that this coaching staff can develop a quarterback? I said, if you don't think you can develop a quarterback, you fire your coach because this is the NFL. One texter says, there's no such thing in the draft as a sure thing. They said that the Titans were getting a sure thing in Skaronsky. Agreed. I've seen a lot of guys that I'm like, that's a solid first-round pick. I like the guy in college. He's going to be a good fit in the NFL. And then it's like, what the hell ever happened to Jerry Judy? (laughs) Right? Like, I mean, we talk about Jerry Judy. I, I... I thought Jerry Judy coming out of Alabama was going to be the next guy. I thought he was going to be the next Amari Cooper, the next Julio Jones, the next great Alabama receiver. And I know he just got $41 million guaranteed, but I think Jerry Judy kind of sucks. Alex from Franklin says, why are we falling for Jim Harbaugh's smokescreen about drafting Joe Alt when they have Rayshon Slater? Jim Harbaugh is trying to swindle Rand Carthon by taking the Titans draft picks. I do not think that Jim Harbaugh is going to, uh, at least he hasn't to me, effectively convinced me that he's going to take all. What seems infinitely more likely, first off, I think if Harrison's there, they're going to take him. Secondly, I think what's infinitely more likely is that they move out of that spot and they go for one of these right tackles. Because, again, they have a left tackle. Latham is a right tackle. I remember Jack Conklin played left tackle in college. And so there was always the idea when the Titans were negotiating Lawan's second contract that the Titans could, in theory, trade Lawan and move Conklin over from right tackle to left tackle. And the GM said, Jack's a right tackle. I said, well, he played left tackle in college. And the GM said, I don't care. <laughs> he said, Jack is a right tackle. And the difference between him and Lawan, Lawan is leaner, a little bit longer, Jack's thicker, you know, kind of wider. And so I, I do think there's kind of a difference there. And so a guy like Latham probably is a right tackle. And if you're the Chargers, why would you want to take a left tackle, move him to right tackle, when you could move down, take a right tackle, and get more picks? One texter says, what if Rand is way smarter than John Robinson and actually does hit on all of his draft picks again like he did last year? See, this is what I'm talking about. What if he hits on him like he did last year, Jared? Hits on him. The Athletic gave him a C- minus for last year's draft. They drafted a guard in the first round with the 11th pick. We don't even know if he's good. They drafted a quarterback in the second round. We don't know if he's good. And they drafted a running back in the third round. And again, you're going to draft a running back in the third round. That needs to be your starting running back. That they just went and got an $8 million running back to go with him. 
So I'm not going to say that it was a terrible draft. I thought C- in the Athletic last week was too harsh. But when you say, hits on all of his picks this year like he did last year, I'm like, hit on all of his picks last year? Says who? You? We don't even know if Skaronsky's good. We don't know if Levis is going to make it or not. Levis might be Kenny Pickett. I don't know. Let's stop throwing parades. I'm not going to chuck him under the bus for the draft, but I'm not going to give him credit either. It's unbelievable. 615-737-1025. Speaking of passes, I gave the Predators a pass for Thursday night. Saturday, they don't get a pass. And they've lost two in a row after that heater. We'll do that next. 615-737-1025. Want to welcome aboard our friends at the Tennessee Men's Clinic. Very, very excited to tell you about them. And so I just want to tell everybody, look, you've put this off for way too long. It's time to get it done. Move forward with that sex life. And the Tennessee Men's Clinic is the leader in bedroom confidence. Look, I'm going to tell, tell you guys this right now. A lot of you guys are probably embarrassed to talk about this. A lot of people are probably like... I don't want to talk about ED. I don't want to. But this show has always been the show that's going to tell like it is. So for you guys out there that need it, I'm telling you right now, you need the Tennessee Men's Clinic. The reality is the pills often quit working and guys start making excuses for not coming to bed. Did you know that studies show that men will be more irritable and argumentative before bed just to avoid failing at intimacy? I did not know that. But hey, just keep that in mind. And I know a lot of you hate going to the doctor. But the Tennessee Men's Clinic was created in 2014 to take care of guys just like you. For a decade, the urologists and the providers of the Tennessee Men's Clinic have helped guys with ED weight loss, and they now even offer aesthetic enhancements and gain hope that they can be successful in the bedroom and beyond. They even offer same-day or next-day appointments. Call 615-208-9090. That's 615-208-9090 or go online to TennesseeMensClinic.com to book an appointment today. That's TennesseeMensClinic.com.
Forsberg tries to whip a pass, and the puck comes back out now to the Nashville zone. Dante Fabro followed up. Coglianos blocked it, and the shot and the score. Yakov Trenin makes his former team pay for a turnover in the Nashville zone. His characteristic leap against the glass and celebration. Oh, it hurt. Oh, it hurt on Saturday. Predators get a lead. Predators get a big lead. Predators knock the other team's goalie out. The other team's goalie's so mad he fires the puck out of the net. He gets an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. And just like that, the Predators are back on the power play. Everything was going right. And then they fell apart. And they lost at Colorado on Saturday. Now, I said on Thursday when the Predators lost, that I was going to give them a pass. Look, you're not going to win every game. They'd had points in 18 straight. They got up 2 nothing. They got a little cocky. And after they got cocky up 2 nothing, the game completely fell apart, and they gave up a bunch of goals. Saturday, they do not get a pass. And here's why they don't get a pass from me for Saturday. Because I look at these games like measuring stick playoff kind of games. I think it is very likely that you will play the Colorado Avalanche in the first round of the playoffs. Now, if you don't win any more games, you won't. But I think it's likely you're going to catch Winnipeg, Colorado's going to be number two, and you're going to play the Colorado Avalanche in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And those are the kind of games that you have to win. You're on the road. You have a multi-goal lead. Something bad happens. You cannot fall apart. And that's what happened on Saturday. Ryan McDonough got tossed from the game, and they awarded a five-minute match penalty, and, you know, the major that goes with it, on McDonough for a shot to the head, which I thought was a fair call. Now, the TV broadcast thought it was a bad call, and Pred's Twitter thought it was a bad call. Oh, my God, the bitching was just... That's not, he was going with the shoulder. He wasn't, it was unfortunate. But McDonough hit the guy in the head. It was a headshot. The only thing, I'm surprised, quite frankly, I'm surprised he's playing tomorrow. I'm surprised he's not suspended. And if he had led with the elbow over the shoulder, then they would have suspended him. My gut tells me, Because, again, I don't know Ryan McDonough very well, but I feel like I probably know him well enough to tell you that he's not a headhunter. We've seen him play now for two years. He's not Ryan Hartman. By the way, did you see Ryan Hartman's in some hot water? Yeah. Didn't he throw his stick at a ref? Something like that, yeah, towards the ref, yeah. So, yeah, there's a difference between that and what Ryan McDonough's done over the two years he's been here. It was unfortunate you know, I don't know if the puck hung up against the wall for yeah, an extra second. Yeah, it was not second. a suspendable hit, but. I I thought he was getting suspended when I saw it. Yeah, no, not quite there. Not quite to that level, I don't think. There's no real intent there. So that's why. Because there wasn't an, what happened was McDonough went for the hit, and I think the puck got cut up or caught up a little Took bit. Took a weird bounce, yeah. And so the guy's trying to adjust to it, and McDonough's going in for the hit, and instead his shoulder goes right into the guy's head. That's going to get you thrown out of games in today's NHL. And instead of the whining and crying about the officiating, which a lot of people wanted to result to, the game was totally different after that penalty. But instead of the whining and crying of that hit, the way I looked at it was there are going to be plays that you don't like and calls that are made that you don't like and bad bounces in the playoffs. And you have to overcome them. You cannot let one bad call like that cost you a game that you have a multi-goal lead in on the road in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, the Predators played the oldest trick in the book, which was starting Kevin Lankinen on the road at Colorado. Here's why. When you start the backup goalie on the road and you lose, you can internalize, well, we played our backup goalie. So even though it might have been a playoff preview, they can't get too confident and we can't get too down on ourselves because we didn't play our starting goalie. I saw Winnipeg come in here and do that in 2018 in a game that essentially decided the division, and they started Michael Hutchison 
and the Predators ran his ass out of there. And, I mean, they just brought the boom. And I knew that Winnipeg could say, well, we didn't play Connor Hellebuck. And then the Predators went on the road to Winnipeg about a week later, and they started UC Soros instead of Pecorine. So that's kind of the oldest trick in the book, which is why Kevin Lankin started on Saturday. But I don't think it makes a difference who plays in net with the Predators because the Predators melted down on Thursday and Soros was in net. They melted down on Saturday and Lankin was in net. So when you get into the playoffs, there is going, just like I told you after you won the Vegas game on the controversial non-offside call, that's the kind of thing that's going to decide a playoff game or maybe even a playoff series. And so I watched that game Saturday, and I wanted to see how the Predators were going to respond to Thursday, but also the matchup with Colorado. Because even though the Predators, Adam Vingan will say, all the analytics say that this is not a fluky run for the Predators, that the Predators are actually, you know, good. All of these people can just, nobody can believe that they'll beat the Colorado Avalanche. Nobody. It's like, well, yeah, but the Avalanche, I mean, they're so good, and there's no way, and yeah, I know the Predators smoked them at Bridgestone Arena. There's no way they can beat them. And I wanted to see how they matched up. And the Predators, for the first 30 minutes of the, I mean, they absolutely stuck it to the Avs. Then the McDonough hit happens. The Predators are playing with five defensemen, and they totally fall apart. And I hated that because you cannot do that in the playoffs and expect to win. I think we all know that the Predators are going to have to steal one in Denver if they end up playing in the playoffs. That's the kind of game you have to take. When you get a couple of goals early, you cannot let momentum get out of hand. You've got to hold it. And they couldn't do it Saturday. And I was really, really disappointed that they were not able to hold it together and find a way to pull out a victory when they had a big lead on Saturday night. I gave them a pass Thursday. I'm not giving them a pass for last night. One texture says McDonough was a guest coach for one of my son's hockey teams, and he emphasized hard physical hockey is great, but cheap and dirty hits are inexcusable. It seems to match his play while he's here. I doubt he was intentionally trying to headhunt. Did anybody say McDonough was trying to headhunt? I mean, I I didn't think he was trying to headhunt. But again, those kind of things are going to happen in the playoffs. Like it's just, it's reality. It's okay. But we have to look at these games and say, okay, if you're in the playoffs and a defenseman goes down, because I kept hearing on the radio broadcast at the end of the game, you know, they're rolling 5D, rolling 5D, rolling 5D. Well, if somebody gets hurt in the middle of a game, which happens, you're going to be rolling 5D. Also, I know it was his first game back. Holy crap, did Dante Fabro suck. Woof! I mean, I was really starting to feel like we were getting to a place with Fabro where I could trust him. And maybe it was his first game back, but on that trending goal we played on that cut coming back from break, what a sorry attempt to get that puck out of the zone by Fabro. Like, why not just put it right in front of the net for the Colorado players to shoot it? Because he was so afraid of the guy behind him that it was this panic just, just put it right up against the board to hopefully it'll get somewhere and it did, right to their player. Unbelievable. One texter says that the uh, Predators are now tied in the standings with the Vegas Golden Knights. I have noticed that. It says, uh, thanks to John Hines, because he pulled the goalie in overtime and it backfired again, and Hines is still screwing up everything for the Predators. I mean, there's no guarantee they would have won. I don't have a problem with Hines pulling the goalie. I mean, he's made it obvious they have to win every game and get two points in every game on their way out. I didn't have a problem with that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number, 615-737-1025. I don't have a problem when people want to look at the positive. I have been accused of always wanting to look at the negative, and I don't think that's true. I don't have a problem with embracing positivity, but I do have a problem when people discourage admitting what happened in games and there is something that happened yesterday that you've got to admit and if not 
You're lying to everybody, including yourself. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 through the game.
Snowman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live from the Busy P Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Studios. So I, years ago, when I first came to town, I was going to be big, tough guy. I was going to be like, I don't root for these teams. I am objective. Even though, of course, I was a Titans fan, a Preds fan, everything else. And so after all that trying, I kind of, you know, melded into who I actually was. One thing I used to say that used to get people really, really, really mad at me when I first came here was I said, well, of course we can't trust the people who call the games. <laughs> like, we can't trust the team announcers for the Atlanta Braves because if we listen to what they say, it's like everything they're going to say is pro-Braves, right? They get on the plane with those guys. They see those guys on the bus. They go to the restaurants, you know. It's like if run into them, hey, hey, you don't want to be like, hey, you said he sucked. Then you get David Price getting into fights with Dennis Eckersley, you know, when you start doing things like that. And, boy, a lot of people got mad at me. And so I've walked that back a little bit. But one of my biggest problems with team journalism or, you know, just, again, state-run stuff is that too often I feel like there's something that happened or didn't happen that somebody tries to tell me actually didn't happen right it did happen and then they try to tell me it didn't happen it didn't happen and they try to tell me it did happen and that stuff i just cannot handle right it's like john hines everybody told me i didn't understand the game and i was right and how many times has it been you know just you guys know this where i said something you didn't agree with it Then it played out over time, and finally you were like, oh, wow, Jared might actually be right about that. Aaron Brewer, you know what I'm talking about. So I just don't like it when people tell me things that didn't happen happened or things that didn't happen did happen. So Joe Rexroad's column in The Athletic ignores exactly why Tennessee lost. Joe wrote today, quote, Rick Barnes got a few questions about the officiating in the game. He didn't bite. He should be heated on multiple fronts. Complaints about him as a coach in March are tired and ignore all that he has done in this job, though his players so badly wanted to deliver him a second Final Four 21 years after his first at Texas. Complaints about the officiating in this game demonstrate a basic misunderstanding of how difficult it is to officiate the interior activity around Purdue Zach Eady and how dominant he was and how basketball works. So basically, Rick Barnes wouldn't criticize the officials. Joe says, give him credit for that. Rick Barnes can't win the big one in March. Joe says, that's tired. We need to talk about the good that Rick Barnes has done. And then we don't need to get mad about officiating because, well, you know, it's hard to officiate. We'll leave the officiating to the side. I thought the game was horrendously officiated, and I think Joe is choosing to ignore that on purpose. But let's get back to Barnes. It's tired, Joe says, to talk about the fact that Rick Barnes never wins in March. The fact that after they won their game on Friday in the Sweet 16 against Creighton, Jay Wright on national TV said, you know, when you make the Final Four, you kind of become a made man in this industry. And so for these two coaches, Rick Barnes and Matt Painter, you know, and I know Coach it's like he had to remind himself, oh, yeah, Rick Barnes did go to that one Final Four 21 years ago. So he did go to that, but he's kind of lost his made man status since then. Joe again just like all the other basketball bennies, they're just ignoring why Tennessee lost. They're ignoring that it is not a coincidence that Rick Barnes hasn't been to a Final Four in 21 years. And yesterday it was obvious to me that Rick Barnes will not change and thus the results will not change because he won't call time out. I have been banging on Rick Barnes For seven years, it feels like, about not calling timeout. I used to bring it up when they almost lost with a, what was it, a three seed in 2019? When they had Admiral Schofield and Grant Williams and Jordan Bone, and they almost lost to Colgate 
in the NCAA tournament because Rick Barnes won't call timeout? I used to bring it up all the time, and Floyd would say, you don't know how many meetings they've had about when to call timeout. You don't know about this. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then I just kind of gave up on, like, the banging on Rick Barnes because it is what it is, and it's not even fun anymore for Tennessee to get to the NCAA tournament, choke away a game, and then afterwards there's the Joe Basketball, Benny, you know, oh, they just didn't hit their shots, it's not the coach's fault. And the obvious of they let the other team go on a run for nine minutes and didn't call timeout. They were up 11, and Purdue went on a 12-0 run and a 13-point swing to go into halftime up by two. Where was the coach? I don't want to bang on Rick Barnes. I want Rick Barnes to call timeout. I want him to slow the momentum of Purdue's run. I want him to realize that maybe it's not an accident that the same thing happens over and over and over and over again. But when you have people like Joe that'll write for you in a column, and again, Joe's not paid media here, but it's so embarrassing that he thinks this way because it is something that somebody who is paid media would think to say, oh, well, it is just so tired to complain about Rick Barnes in March. Is it tired to tell the man, can you just freaking call timeout? Can you just do something to change the game? Even Charles Barkley at halftime knew that Rick Barnes' inability to call timeout was ultimately going to cost them the game. I will tell you this. Tennessee, if they lose this game, they lost it in the last five minutes. When they had that 11-point lead, then they let Purdue go on that run. I think people always understand when you lose a game sometimes, people are like, well, there's one or two plays that happen at the end of the game, and people harp on that. They had a 11-point lead, then they just fell asleep at the wheel. They they shouldn't be down at all. He's not wrong. And where was the coach? The same coach against, who was it that they lost to? Was it Purdue again in that Sweet 16? In uh, the kid, they had the three-point shooters in 2019? The same, this happens every time. They just let, every time. They just let the other team go on a run, and that coach just stands there with his arms crossed. And I really wasn't in – I didn't. I don't want to bang on Barnes. I want good things to happen to him because he's a good man, and he is a good coach. But it's just this one thing that he, for the life of him, cannot – he just – he won't do it. He won't call timeout. And I don't understand it. Did you notice what happened when Tennessee went on the run that led them to an 11-point lead? Ian, did you see what Matt Painter did when Tennessee had an 11-point lead in the first half? Yeah, I did. What did he do? He called a timeout. He called timeout! Not Rick. Rick's got to save those timeouts for the very end of the game for when they're down six and they score to put them down four. Call timeout then. I mean, it's just like, I thought we were done with this. I thought we, uh, at some point, and and here's, I guess, the point I'm getting at. Because, like, what do I care? But at some point, Rick Barnes has to do his part. And he won't do it. Like, he'll get up there after the game's over, and he'll say, well, you know, I just wish we could have had a different outcome, but... Sometimes you play in the games and the games don't go your way. And, you know, it's just I'm thankful that I get to wake up every day and coach these great players. And maybe one day the game will go our way. But, you know, it's just very tough that the game didn't go our way. It's like maybe if you wouldn't do the same freaking thing over, over, and over again, you'd get a different result. And so, again, when it's like, Let's not talk about Rick Barnes screwing it up all the time like Joe wrote at The Athletic. Or let's not talk about the officiating, which was horrendous. It's like you're ignoring what happened in the game yesterday. Tennessee should be in the Final Four. And if we want to say, well, you know, uh, it's just basketball and it sucks that it's this way and somebody had to lose, that's loser talk. The reality is, 
Tennessee should be in the Final Four, and they're not today, and a large reason for it is the coach. 615-737-1025. We will get to your phones at 615-737-1025. And again, I, I, I can go on all day about this. Why is it that every other coach in America, except for Rick Barnes and Kevin Stallings, can call a timeout when the game starts to get out of hand? I don't understand. 615-737-1025. Keep it here, by the way, for our CAA tournament coverage here on the Stillman & Company program. Brought to you by Toyota. Ready, set, go get your Toyota today at toyota.com.
connect for three. And Edie with the rebound. Lance Jones got away with one there because that was going to be an open shot. You got to fight over those screens big time against this guy. This is the 28th time this year Purdue has had a run of at least 10-0 or more. And now it's 12 in a row for the Boilermakers. Every time they're in the half court, something good happens. Again, I wish I could make it the outcome different for them, but uh, the fact that God's blessed me with the time I've had with these guys is something that I wish every coach could enjoy. Oh, man, I wish uh, we could have done something different. You could have called timeout. You could have called timeout. Stop the bleeding. An 11-point lead turns into a deficit. In fact, Ian, give me that play-by-play -play cut because this is what every other coach in America would do in this instant. Go ahead and play the cut. Connect for three. And Edie with the rebound. Lance Jones got away with one there because At this point, that was going to be an Coach open Stillman shot. is like, if they score here, we're calling timeout. Big time against this guy. This is the 28th time this year Purdue has had a run of at least Coach 10 Stillman. or more. And now it's 12 in a row. All right, timeout. Timeout, 30 right here. And then, you know, that's where it's like, and now it's 12 for the Boilermakers, and Jared Stillman wants a timeout. They're going to talk it over. And then, you know, you'll get the little CBS March Madness music and the, the Jim Nance and Charles Barkley and Spike Lee commercials. And then, you know, everybody will get to kind of cool down, and then they'll come back, and then, oh, okay, we'll get back. Calm down. We're okay. We're okay. Not Rick Barnes. Not Rick Barnes. They show him on the sideline. I mean, he's just standing there. At least Mike Vrabel, when he'd crap away a game, he'd bend over at the waist like he's about to throw up into the toilet. Instead, Rick Barnes just standing there just like, man, I wish there was something I could do right now. But I guess I can't. I guess there's nothing I can do as we squander this 11-point lead in the Elite Eight. And it just drives me crazy that people are like, how can you get mad at the coach for that, Jared? Like every other coach would do it. One texter says, and our phone line is driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com. Jared, you said earlier today the best players besides Connect and uh, besides Dalton Connect were Estrella and Ganey. And now you're reducing the game to a single timeout from Rick Barnes? No. I am reducing. First of all, there's a lot of reasons why Tennessee lost, right? And this is how every game works. Where it's like, oh, if this guy would have hit this home run, then it would be different. But. The coach, when, once the game starts, the coach only has so many tools at his disposal. And one of them that every other coach in America seems to utilize is the ability to call timeout to slow a run. This has happened in all of these Tennessee games, by the way. Tennessee was blowing out Creighton. And then Creighton went on a run. And you know what Rick Barnes didn't do? He didn't call timeout. And the difference is, is that Creighton's not as good as Purdue. So when you let Purdue do the same thing they got Creighton back in the game, Purdue is going to win the game because Purdue is better. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's at fault. I'm sure if all the players made all of their shots, then it doesn't matter who the coach is. That's how Barry Switzer wins a Super Bowl. But at some point, I mean, how many NCAA tournament games do you want to go watching Josiah Jordan James throw up some bull crap up at the, up at the basket and to see the other team go on an 8-0 run, only to see Rick Barnes standing on the sideline, knowing that after the game he'll say, well, shucks, we didn't win today, and I wish we had. I mean, how many more times are you going to let that go? And I I have just let this, like, like, it's just, it's reality. You know, like, it's just, I've decided when it comes to Barnes, I used to enjoy the Tennessee fans that would get their hopes up because Tennessee would either win the SEC or they'd come in second or they'd have a really good team. They'd have the eighth ranked team in the country and Lenardi would have them on the three line and they get so mad about how can the eighth ranked team be on the three line or something like that. And they'd get mad every single time and everybody. And I used to enjoy that knowing that they'd get their hopes up and then they'd play Montana state in the second round of the tournament and lose. And every time it was the same, and I'd get to say, I told you so, like I told you so about Wayne Tinkle in Oregon State or when they lost to FAU or whatever. 
But because it's now well established that Rick Barnes, for some reason, is allergic to in-game strategy in the month of March. I mean, if they had made it one more day, they'd have been into April. And I have no idea how good of a coach, no idea how good of a coach Rick Barnes will be in April. But I know he's not a good coach in March. And all they had to do was call timeout. That's it. And I used to enjoy all of this. I don't enjoy it anymore. I want to see Rick Barnes do well. But if Rick Barnes won't change how he operates, the same thing will happen over and over and over and over again, right? It's like Mike Vrabel in the offensive line. If you keep having these bozos coach and these guys that aren't any good playing, you're never going to protect a quarterback. And it'll happen again. It doesn't matter if it's Tannehill or if it's Levis, you'll get the quarterback hurt. Because the same thing will happen over and over and over and over again. And that's what's happening here with Rick Barnes. And so it, just, it made me mad yesterday. Like, I mean, I feel bad for the dude because I want good things to happen to him because it looks like he deserves. I don't know him, but everybody that does know him and just his public persona, like, this is a man that deserves good things to happen to him. And he couldn't do it. One texter says, Barnes wasn't the reason the Vols lost, Jared. You were singing his praises all last week. No. I was telling you, it wasn't like I looked at Rick Barnes and said, Rick Barnes is a changed man. I just thought this team could overcome him not calling timeout and trying to ruin the NCAA tournament the way he has in the past. But I mean, singing his praises, I want good things to happen to him. But first of all, outside of the timeout, I did not like Rick Barnes' game plan. I did not like the way that I felt like they were trying to, like, half front Edie in the post, either do it or don't. But I also thought the game plan should have been let Edie get his, do not let Braden Smith or Lawyer or those guys, do not let them go off. And I didn't like that. Then, I mean, I didn't like the fact that he wouldn't call timeout. I didn't like some of the plays they drew up out of the timeout. Elbow jump shot for Josiah Jordan James, really. And I, you know, I, I really didn't like when he brought a walker back because I thought Estrella was doing pretty well. I thought it was too early to do that and to bring him back in there. And so all those things add up together. Like, you got to help your team win. I mean, I know it's the guys that make and miss the shots, but you're the coach. You have to do something to help your team win. And I don't think Rick Barnes did that. I thought it took him too long to get to Ganey. To realize that Ganey was probably the second best player on the floor yesterday for Tennessee. 615-737-1025 more of your phones by the way Joe's mad Ian no surprise he Joe's probably mad. should be why should he be mad oh, you called him a uh, state run media Joe wrote that we should uh, again complaints about Barnes as a coach in March are tired and ignore all he has done in this job no Complaints about him in March highlight the failures that are keeping Rick Barnes from being a perfect coach. That's the story. We'll get to that in your phones next. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Window Nation. I had Window Nation out to my home, and they took a look at my windows, and I said, all right, tell me what I need replaced. And Window Nation said, you don't need to replace your windows. And ever since that experience on that free in-home estimate, I have felt totally just secure in telling you guys about Window Nation because I know that they'll treat your home on the free in-home estimate with the same care and respect that they treated me. They didn't try to pull a fast one on me, and I appreciate that. April is here, and your windows and if your windows won't open for the fresh air or seal out all of that oof, pollen and bugs, then you got to talk to Window Nation. Because right now, for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two windows free. There's no limit to how much you could save. Plus, you could save even more with no interest or payments for 24 months. With proven quality, you'll get affordable windows that meet or beat the national brands. Do not miss out. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com. Again, for every two windows you, you buy, you'll get two free. Plus, no interest, zero payments for 24 months. 
Again, that phone number is 866-90-NATION, online at windownation.com to schedule your free in-home estimate today. Ten seconds left. Connect. Ziegler puts up a three. No good. Lawyer the rebound. Five seconds left. Lawyer will dribble it out. And the next stop on the Purdue Redemption Tour is the Final Four. First time in 40. I mean, it made me crazy yesterday watching all of that because the story nationally was about how great this was for Purdue. They haven't been to the Final Four since Gene Cady. They last year lost to Fairleigh Dickinson. Matt Painter is a pants pooper in the tournament. And Edie's this great player. And just, it's a great game. And it's great for everybody. And it's, and it drove me crazy watching all of that, you know, on the desk after the game was over where you know, there was Kenny and Charles and Jay Wright and Greg Gum or uh, not Greg Gumble, We can't wait to have Greg Gumble back. Clark Kellogg up there. And I just looked at it and I said to myself, I'm like, they're ignoring the fact that Tennessee ha- Tennessee should have won this game. So Joe Rex shows mad. So I said, again, I took the beginning of his column in which, you know, Joe said that, We shouldn't talk about the officiating, which was terrible, by the way. And we shouldn't talk about Rick Barnes and his struggles, and it's so tired to hear of that. And all I'm asking is, can we call timeout once? But nope, the basketball bennies will not let us for a second question whether or not Rick Barnes should have called timeout in that 12-0 run. 
Joe says. He's Tennessee's winningest NCAA coach. He got them to their second Elite Eight in their history and three Sweet sweet Sixteens. That's not winning in March, Joe says. And this timeout thing is so dumb and factually inaccurate. Elite Eight happens over and over again. Embarrassing doesn't begin to describe your take on this. So Joe's mad that I brought up the timeout thing. This timeout thing with Rick Barnes is not new. Push that to the side. The second thing is we can talk about, well, you know, it's the second Elite Eight ever in Tennessee history, so we should all be happy about it. This was the team. Like, this was the team. I watched NC State, and this is the thing about this tournament that, again, maybe one day Barnes will luck into it, where they will play some Crap teams en route to the Final Four. You know, they couldn't get past Sister Jean that one year, but if they did, they probably would have ended up in the Final Four. And one day the bracket will break for them. And again, you know, I I said it was a good thing that they lost that Friday of the SEC tournament. It probably was a bad thing in hindsight, only because had they won and then lost on Saturday, they would have been in North Carolina's region playing Alabama and Clemson as opposed to playing Purdue and Edie. But that's a different discussion. This was the team. Like, this was the team to get to the Final Four. And they lost. And that doesn't mean that Barnes is a bad coach. That doesn't mean that Barnes should be fired. And I'm not saying any of those things. You know, I've talked about this 2009 Louisville team. You know, I became a Louisville fan in 2007 when I decided I was going to go to college there. And so in 2007, 2008, you know, that basketball year, they lost the Elite Eight to North Carolina, and I really became a Louisville fan because I knew I was going to college there. And you know how it is, Ian, right? Like, you want to wear all the, you know, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to Louisville next year. That's my team. Go, team, go. So they lost in the Elite Eight. Okay. That, no, they lost to Tyler Hansborough in North Carolina, and they were just better than them. The next year, they had the number one team in the country. And they lost in the Elite Eight to Michigan State. And even though Louisville would go to the Final Four unexpectedly in 2012, and they'd win the national championship in 2013, I always look back at that 2009 team and the next year, the 2014 team that lost to Kentucky, and I looked at that and I said, those were moments where Patino could not get out of his own way. Now, I would argue that if we were just going mono e mono and everybody had the same players i really think there could be a strong argument made that rick patino might be the best basketball coach period just in terms of strategy motivation development all of those things like patino can win with losers and that's why he wins everywhere almost got st john's a program that's been dormant for years almost got them into the tournament this year Went to the wire with UConn. And we see how good UConn is. But in 2009, Patino couldn't get out of his own way. He got in a fight with Terrence Williams, the star player, during a media timeout, and it ruined the entire game, and a team that should have won the national championship didn't. And I still hold that against Patino. Now, Patino ultimately made up for it, and then, you know, all the scandals. But I didn't forget about that. That's what this is with Barnes. It's not like I'm saying they should fire him. But to ignore his culpability in yesterday's ball game, I think, is disingenuous. I think, I think that Rick Barnes had an opportunity to slow that Purdue run down, didn't. I think Rick Barnes had a chance earlier in the game to go to Ganey, didn't. I thought he went to Awaka too soon. And I really thought the game plan that they had defensively for Purdue was, we're going to do what we do, they're going to do what they do, and we're going to see who wins. Whereas my game plan would have been, we're going to let Edie do what he wants in the post. Because he's going to score 40. But we're not going to let those other guys go off. And then I'm going to score 60. And that's how we're going to win. One texture says, I'm with you, Jared. It drives me crazy for a coach to not call timeout in that situation, I would call timeout as soon as they cut the lead to four or five. Do not wait until it's too late. Call it before you give up the lead. For some reason, 
I have this weird sense in me. Like, there's no way in which I say, okay, you know, if they score three consecutive buckets, I call timeout. To me, it's just a feel thing. But I will be at games, I'll see a ball go through the basket, and I will be thinking about this all, during the possession where I'm like, if they score here, you're going to call timeout. And, I mean, I was at the Florida-Alabama game, and I think Alabama got off to like an 8 nothing start at the SEC tournament. And I turned to my friend I was at the game with, and I said to her, I go, once Alabama scored to make it 8 nothing, I just turned and I go, timeout. And immediately the coach, you know, calls timeout, and you hear the whistles blow, and it's like, wow, how, how did you know that? I'm like, it's just a feel thing. That every coach in America, except for Kevin Stallings and Rick Barnes, seem to have. I do not get it. I do not understand it. Lenny says, explain how the officiating was bad in the basketball game, Jared. I thought it was wildly inconsistent. And we can go into it deeper. But you cannot call. I'm fine. If we're going to call it tight, I'm fine. You put that arm bar, Awaka puts the arm bar on Edie, and, you know, it's got the other hand on it. You want to call that? Fine. But when Awaka is trying to front the post and Edie is hooking him, you know, with his arm to keep him from getting around to front the we got to call that that way, send it back the other way. We can't miss moving screens, which they didn't call. We can't, again, we're talking about a hand check on Edie. Or every time Edie's in there, we call a foul. Dalton Connect's coming off a screen. Lawyers grabbing him by the shorts. They won't call that. We can't call a hand check because it's in the post over here and not call it on the perimeter over there. And I felt, and I felt like we did that far, far too often in that game. Texas says Rick Barnes couldn't even win with Kevin Durant. I, you know, that's been the easiest line to throw at him. I don't know how they lost that year with Kevin Durant other than I think I was in Orlando, Florida on spring break with my dad in like the ninth grade when that happened. One texture says, do you think Barnes will be here through his whole contract or will he retire before that? I don't know. Barnes, and even for me who has criticized Barnes and everything else, Barnes, in my opinion, has earned the right to name his exit. And I think it's okay with that. 615-737-1025 615-737-1025 is our phone number. If you want to weigh in, 615-737-1025. And um, I got to tell you that people just, it's like we've been trained to feel a certain way, especially when it comes to the Vols. And this is the one time out of the five billion times this has happened, this is the one time that I actually agree with the Vol fan sentiment. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063 the game.
Rob Lewis with VolQuest.com. Uh, coach, just what about the way the game was officiated? How difficult, you know, was it to, I guess, to, to coach your guys on how to de try to defend Edie with the way the game was called? Well, one, you, you've got a very unique player, Zach Edie, very unique, and uh, it's a hard game to officiate. Um, the space on the court is so important, and. Uh, depending on how a guy gets there and how you try to keep him from getting there and the effort that goes into that uh, oftentimes can get the one guy in particular there out of position where he can maybe help on some other different things. But uh, he, he's an extremely uh, physical player, uh, does a great job uh, wedging with his body. Uh, I, I thought all along uh, his misses are the hardest thing to defend because uh, – you know, he does lead strong when he, he'll, he'll bounce you off and try to create a crack and step through it. That's where he's improved so much with his footwork. But uh, I think it's hard for officials because there's not many guys like that. And uh, it's, the game has changed so much through the years. And whether you stay in the lane three seconds or you don't, um, if you don't ever get out, it really distorts everything. And I'm not saying he did or he didn't, but watching tape, it's a, it, it, he's a difficult guy to officiate. I'm not saying he did or he didn't. I'm just saying. <laughs> so let me say this. My entire life, I'm 34 years old. How old is somebody when they can start remembering things? Five? What age, Ian, what age do people start remembering stuff? Yeah, I think it varies for people, but I think five is around average. I feel like I have some memories from when I was like three and four years old, but not like yeah, nothing real strong memories from yeah, that. yeah. So for thirty years of my life, I'm thirty four. For thirty years of my life, I have listened to Tennessee fans call into radio shows the Monday after Tennessee losses, and very often it's the same script, right? The refs cheated us is always towards the top. I remember, you know, it used to always be about John Chavis and Randy Sanders. Then when they started getting mad about Philip Fulmer, I knew he was in trouble. But this is the one time. How many ball games, football and basketball, have been played over the last 34 years? A million? So out of the one million times, this and a Jabbar Gaffney clock management fiasco, was his foot in, was it not, game against Florida years ago, these are the two times where I can look at a game and say, ah, the Vols are, you know, they got screwed by the refs. I thought yesterday they got screwed by the refs. I thought the game was way too inconsistent. And while 99.9% .9 of the time, and had I not watched the game yesterday and you had told me that, oh, Vol fans are complaining about the refs, I would have said, oh, there they go again. But I saw the game. And I saw how inconsistent the officiating was. I thought it was a train wreck yesterday. And quite frankly, I think that that's something. Like, I understand the idea that Edie's hard to officiate, but that doesn't mean that Edie is impossible to officiate. I told Caroline last night, I said, this reminds me of Shaq versus the Sacramento Kings in the 2000s. I remember Sacramento was just going down the bench. You know, they had they started off with, uh, with Vladi Divot, on Shaq, and then he got in foul trouble and fouled out. So then they had to go down the bench to Scott Pollard, who, by the way, I think was at VU Medical Center and got a heart transplant and lived. They had to go down the bench to Scott Pollard. He went in the game. He got in foul trouble, and he had to come out. And then they had to bring out Lawrence Funderburk, had to get in the game to guard Shaquille O'Neal because Sacramento had no bigs, and every time Shaq caught the ball, they called a foul. And I'm like, who in the hell is Lawrence Funderburk? And, like, that's who's going in the game because they can't. That's what I felt like yesterday. Except for, the, I told Caroline, I go, this was like Shaq back in the day. Which we later found out that the refs were on the take. Like, that's the one time that we found out the refs were on the take was that time with Shaq and the Sacramento Kings. I'm not saying the refs were on the take. I just didn't think they were very consistent, nor do I think they were very good. And another thing, I think the officials let the very pro-Purdue crowd affect them. And let me say this about that, because I haven't touched on this yet, and yet it was a topic that I want to talk about today, which was 
I'm a little disappointed in the Vol fan base. You guys pump your chest about how big and bad you are all the time. And you couldn't get more fans into that building? I mean, it was 90%, at least it looked like on TV, 90% Purdue. And I understand that Detroit is more accessible to Indiana than it is to Tennessee. But it ain't hard to get to Detroit, folks. It is not hard to get to Detroit. And I'm not pointing any individual out and saying, you should have spent $2,000 to go to these basketball games. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that I expect you to have more fans there than Purdue. And I can't, for the life of me, I can't figure out why they didn't. I was really surprised by that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number on the program. 615-737-1025 here on the program. Our phone line is driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com. Dan has been waiting patiently and is up next on the Vols. What's up, Dan? Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yep, Yep, go. All right. Very good. So, number one, I just want to clarify that you're saying that your game plan would be to let Edie get his and then just contain everybody else, right? Just hey, just don't let anybody else shoot. So, they went 11 for 32 and 2 for 15 from 3. So they're, Well, 3 for 15 from 3. So, there's that. And they still won. Number two, we got to add some, some clarity, well, some context to this entire scenario as well. You've got a Boilermaker team that has – this was their year for the Final Four. You can say that about the Vols, right? But if you look historically, so many times the Boilermakers have been able to say that about their teams with Jaden Ivey, when they had Carson Edwards getting hot, when they had Caleb Swanigan. So What's that have to do hope. with any of this? That has to do with the fact that you said that if there was any time, there was any team to go to the Final Four for UT, it would be this year. This was the but team. It, it, it takes – it takes time to build these programs up. No, 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 Dan. NC State is in the Final Four, Dan. I don't want to hear this. Thank you for your call. I don't want to hear this because this is that's what losers say. You know, again, I'll use Louisville as the example. Kenny Payne, you know, oh, this program's broken. That's why we can't get any good players. This is that. New coach comes in last week. And they've raised $2 million in NIL. They've got like four commits coming in here. I don't want to hear this. In college basketball, your team is different every year. And so to sit there and say, you know, well, this is what happened 20 years ago. College basketball ain't the same anymore. Vincent is up next here on our program. Thank you for waiting. What's up, Vincent? Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. That's what losers say. Look at Alabama, okay? Well, they're in it. I mean, come on. Yes, that is exactly why the University of Tennessee is garbage. And I'm a fan. That's exactly our mindset, our mentality for the last 20 years with every sport up there. Well, you know, it just takes time. Come on, I'm tired of it. But anyway, the reason I called was, you know, I love Joe. Listen to his show in the morning. But As you should. As I should, and I do. Love your, love your radio station. But anyways. Thank you. The same tired stuff coming out about Barnes, and he is the way they have Koharski on their show. Talk about tired. Man, come on, Joe. You're better than that. But anyways, yes, they should fire Barnes. Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say that. Don't put that on no, me. No, no, no. This is, this is my opinion. This is my opinion. They should fire Barnes, but they won't. No, no, they won't. Because, and this is why. He's not good in March. There's a reason why. The game has passed him by. He's a regular season dub machine. I'll give him that. And that's great. He's still in the arena. Uh, Good. But that's why I'm saying they're good with status quo. They don't want to hoist championships. So here's where I disagree with you, Vincent. And I I appreciate your call. And I don't think Barnes should be fired. I think Barnes is the Marty Schottenheimer of college basketball. That's who I think he is. Now. Here's how I know you're wrong about this. They fired Kelly Harper today, the women's basketball coach at Tennessee. And Kelly Harper had done an okay job. She certainly had not done up to, you know, the Pat Summit standard of Tennessee basketball. And they fired her anyways. I was shocked by it. And 
I'm convinced without having any inside knowledge of this whatsoever, I'm convinced Danny White fired her because he's going to go hire Wes Moore, who's actually very good friends with Kelly Harper, and followed Kelly Harper got fired at NC State. They hired Wes Moore, and now NC State's in the Final Four, and they're a one seed you know, consistently and competing for the ACC. And I think they're going to go hire Wes Moore, who is a winner. Like, I think this is a slam dunk. The guy who's the head coach of Chattanooga, he's a great guy. Like, I think it is a slam freaking dunk. And I think that's why they fired Kelly Harper, because he's not okay with being okay at women's basketball. So if he's not okay with being okay at women's basketball, we know they're good right now at football and baseball, and they're good at basketball. Not great, you know, because Barnes will always poop his pants somehow. You can't say that that's where Tennessee is. You can't do it. All right, more of your phones on this next. 615-737-1025 here on Stillman & Company. Here on 1025-1063 The Game. I also have an NFL draft thought that I do want to get to at some point here that we will do. But let's talk about FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel Sportsbook is my official sportsbook app, and the sports calendar is loaded right now, and FanDuel is making it more excited to get in on all the action. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any, that's any, Winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tournament, baseball, the NBA, NHL, and so much more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash JGM and make your first bet a big win, just like the Braves have been doing so far. They just scored nine runs on the White Sox. That's FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, and my official sportsbook app. 21 and over in present Tennessee. First online real money wager, only $10 first deposit required. Bonus issues, is with drawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1 800 
Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live from the Busy Bee Heating, Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Studio. I will get that down soon enough, but we're glad to have Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning along with us for the ride here. So we'll get to your phone, 615-737-1025, Tennessee loses to Purdue in the Elite Eight. 95% of the talk about Tennessee's loss is that, look, Purdue's a great team, and it was a great game. And when you have a great game, one of the two teams has to lose. And that this was Purdue's year. And after they got beat by a 16 seed last year, you know, this was the moment for Edie and Painter and for those boys. And so it sucks the balls didn't win, but, you know, you got to tip your cap. To which I say, bull crap. I say you should be in the Final Four if you're a Tennessee fan. You should be upset that you're not in the Final Four. And the three reasons that I think you should be upset, number one, I thought the game was horrendously officiated. I don't mind. We're going to let them play. I also don't mind the we're going to call it tight. What I don't like is selectively on some possessions calling the game tight. Oh, we're going to call a walk-up for that arm bar into the shoulder of uh of Edie, but then the next time down we're not going to call him hooking as a walker's trying to front the post i don't like that and i thought we got that the second thing i didn't think rick barnes had a very good day specifically the end of the first half run i thought he should have called timeout i thought he should have let the team regroup I thought that, you know, again, you just you cannot sit there and do nothing as you go from up 11 on a 13-point swing to down two at the half. And then third, Edie had 40, Dalton Connect had 37. If you're the man, you got to carry your team to victory at some point late in the game. Not that Connect's going to make every shot. Michael Jordan didn't make every shot. But late in the game, Dalton Connect had opportunities to either put Tennessee in front or put Tennessee, you know, put them right back in there, and he didn't come through. And that's why they're not there. That's just me. Uh, let's go to our phones, which are driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com. Robert is up next on the Vols. Thank you for calling. Thank you for waiting. What's up, Robert? Hey, how you doing, Mr. Spenny? You're doing out this afternoon. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, have a good week. Good Easter. Get to the take, Robert. All right, here we go. I'm going to get to the take. All right, I agree with you on your three on your three reasons. Uh, it's piss poor game management, and I am pissed. We should be in the final four. Damn right. Uh, the the only thing I've seen in that game that nobody's said anything about is we're launching the damn threes, man. Come on, man. If you ain't hitting the three, get the two. Okay, come on. It's just that damn simple. It's not rock science. Uh, I don't know what. What happened to Barnes? He does it every March. He has a blind moment, a brain fart, whatever. His game management in March sucks. Look back at Texas when he had the rent. He couldn't do anything then. Uh, but they're not going to fire him. You know, they're going to fire Kelly Hopper. She's been there five years, got 108 wins in five years, made the tournament every year. Tennessee's the only lady, te- the lady team that's made the tournament since it's been going on. But it's, uh, it's just so aggravating that it's the same shit Hey, easy, Robert. Calm down. And I really wanted to know how he was going to end that. But, man, that was like a cowboy right there calling the show. Let me say this. I'm not going to cry any tears over Kelly Harper getting fired. And I don't think Rick Barnes should be fired. I mean, I think Barnes is the perfect coach for Tennessee. I've said this year after year after year because, for the most part, the same things happen, which is Tennessee has a good team. This team was a great team. The other Tennessee teams were good teams. But every year, Tennessee has a good team. The fans get excited, and then they go off and poop their pants in the tournament. This was the year Tennessee fans, I think, were afraid to be invested. I actually don't think the Tennessee fans were as hurt yesterday as they have been in the past. I think... Part of it is because, hey, at least they got to the Elite Eight, and it's not like they got to the Elite Eight and lost to Scarbini Tech, right? You know, they lost to Purdue, who's a one seed. But as far as, like, every year, he gives you a team to cheer about until the tournament, and then something happens, and then you're mad for the day, and then you move on to baseball because Tennessee's a football school. 
And if there was any question as to whether or not Tennessee was a football school, look at that crowd yesterday. And again, I am, and I'm not throwing the Vol fan base under the bus. I'm just shocked more people weren't there. Like if you had asked me before the game that Tennessee's playing Purdue at, in Detroit, Elite Eight, what do you think the crowd makeup is? I said 50-50. If not, I would have expected that there would be more Vol fans there than there would be Purdue fans. And you would say, more Vol fans than Purdue fans? Well, Tennessee has a larger fan base than Purdue. And while I know Tennessee is a football school, and Purdue most certainly is not, while I understand that, it's not like there are people that are only Vol football fans and aren't Vol fans, period. So I was surprised by that. Just like, you know, Tennessee makes it to the College World Series, I expect a lot of Vol fans in Omaha. That's just, you're one of the, the biggest, baddest fan bases around. And so I guess I was a little surprised by that. Um, but, I mean, look, Barnes shouldn't be fired. Barnes is doing a good job. And then on top of it, I would say that Kelly Harper, like, there's a different standard for women's basketball at Tennessee than there is for men's basketball. It's as simple as that. And I, again, if they had kept Kelly Harper, I wouldn't have been surprised. But when they fired her, it wasn't like I thought, (gasps) they fired Kelly Harper? I thought, huh, showing some teeth. And I got a friend who's on that coaching staff. So it's not like I like that news. But I saw it, and I was like, got some teeth. Now, if they end up not hiring Westmore, there are three people that I think that, you know, like if I was Tennessee, that I'd fire this I'd fire kelly harper for one is jeff walls at louisville they're not going to get him they had their opportunity when they hired kelly harper but philip fulmer you know decided he had to hire a woman and had to hire somebody off the pat tree and so now he's got a new contract pays him two million bucks a year and he's got a retirement plan i don't think he's moving you know to knoxville so i don't think they're going to get him westmore number two he's a little bit older And he's friends with Kelly Harper, but Kelly Harper got fired at NC State. Wes Moore took the job there, so I don't see why he'd be against doing that again. And then third is Scott Rusick, who is the head coach at Oregon State. He's a good coach, and we know that Oregon State doesn't have much of a program. Other than that, if they hire somebody else, then I don't know what they're doing. Lance is up next on the Vols. Thank you for calling and waiting. What's up, Lance? Well, you know, one thing I think that they should do in the NCAA is do away with it three-second lane violation because probably 50% of the points that Easy scored, three seconds, they, they could have been turnovers. But I was shocked by the that. game the way it's supposed to be called. I mean, he camped out. He could have sat there in the lane all day long. He could have pitched a tent, and that's what he did. And that's how he scored all those points. You can't move that big old boy out of there. He's got to get in and out of the lane and not let him set out. And I'll hang up and listen to what you have to say. I was screaming at the television three seconds over and over again because he doesn't even try. I mean, he just stands in there. And, you know, I thought that what Estrella did was Estrella did a better job than Awaka at playing physically without making it obvious that he was fouling. And then Adu was just terrible last night. One texture says, I followed Rick Barnes closely during his career at Texans and have met him in person several times. He is a great person, but not a championship coach. During the 06-07 season at Texas with Durant, he lost to Kansas in the Big Ten tournament and then lost to USC in the second round of the NCAA tournament. The peak of his career was the 03-04 season when he reached the Final Four with T.J. Ford. He is never going to exceed this season's accomplishments at Tennessee, and the school needs to move on from him in a mutually respectful fashion. I think that he's checking all the boxes at Tennessee. Like, going to the Final Four is not an expectation at Tennessee. So, it's unbelievable. One texture says, imagine if everyone just listened to your hypothetical takes, Jared. You'd have, like, 15 Super Bowls and 35 national championships. You are the game plan merchant after the fact. Let me say this. How many times over the last year have I told you Like, hey, this is not going to work. And everyone says, oh, you're just a hater, Jared. Like with Aaron Brewer. 
And I was like, this isn't going to work. He's 270 pounds. Oh, you're just a hater, Jared. You just always. And then finally, after about six weeks, Jared's right. Craig Aukerman, John Hines, Vrabel body bagged you at the press conference over Aukerman. And then Vrabel had to get up there in front of everybody with his tail in between his legs and say, I've decided that uh, we're going to go in a different direction. I thank Craig for everything that he's done. Oh, you showed me. So when you say like, oh, these teams, Jared, if everyone just listened to you, I'm like, there's a lot of these times where I was right from day one. You know it. You don't want to admit it. It's okay. 615-737-1025. Speaking of the Titans, I have a shocking draft scenario that one very prominent NFL analyst is actually putting his name to. I have a very shocking draft scenario that I won't be upset about. Then I have a second one that I will go crazy about. From the same guy, we'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game.
My number one thing is say adding playmakers to our team, whether that's offensively, defensively. Just looking to bring people in that, that love football, um, that want to be in our place. I mean, if you look at the way our coaching staff was built, uh, we got you know some of the best coaches available. I think these a lot of guys had other offers and could have been in other places but chose to be with us, um, and that's the talent part about who they are. But if you look at who they are as people and their passion for the game, I think it, it resonates and it's going to permeate throughout our locker room. Yeah, that was Rand Carthon talking about, hey, we got to add playmakers. Offense, defense, add playmakers. And they have ad- added some playmakers in free agency. Ridley can make some plays. Legereus Sneed can make some plays. You know, they've added some, Some. I mean, you know, you ain't going to get upset about that. So, Ian brought this to my attention yesterday. I did not know that our friends at Moving the Chains on Sirius XM NFL Radio, they were doing their mock draft. I mean, I do feel like, Ian, they do like 10 of these in the month of April on Fridays. Yeah, they, I think they do one every Friday for a little bit. This is I can't remember if this was version 2 or version 3. So we do have to at some point. We did this last year. Instead of Jared versus Joe, we did the Stillman and Company mock draft where me, Caroline, Robbie, and Joe all had like teams and would like trade picks and things like that, which was actually a lot of fun. And uh, we may have to do that again. But moving the chains, Pat Kerwin on NFL Radio's longtime NFL guy. Whether it's the media, he's a former coach, he's a former executive. You know, Pat can talk to any of these football guys, and it's like, Pat! You know, so he's he is well-respected. So Pat Kerwin had the Titans on the board in the NFL mock draft, the NFL radio mock draft. And here's where he went at number seven. The Tennessee Titans are on the clock with the seven spot. Yeah, they have uh, lots of needs, and uh, everyone thinks offensive tackle, uh, but there's depth at the offensive tackle. Uh, so I'm going to, and I have a pick at 38. I either am going to get back into the first round. I have a couple of spots I could come back into, or I could wait and take one at 38 because I do think if we use last week's mock draft, that could happen. So I'm going to go right to the board and take the guy I think's the best guy left, and he's a very good football player. <laughs> Uh, they will take. That sounds like the pick is in with that music. I love that. Dallas Turner out of Alabama, the big pass rusher. Uh, you can't go wrong taking the best pass rusher in the draft. Okay. Dallas Turner, not a tackle like we've talked about. Not one of these Marvin Harrison Juniors. Not one of those. And in this instance, four quarterbacks, Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors, were off the board. In the moving the chains mock draft. So Adunze was there. Bowers was there. Alt was there. And instead, he's got the Titans taking Dallas Turner, the pass rusher, with the seventh pick. And I'm sure there are some of you out there that think, oh, my God, Jared, if they take Dallas Turner as opposed to Joe Alt or a left tackle or a right tackle or something like that, if they do that on draft night, you are going to go crazy on Rand Carthon. And the answer to that is, I don't think I will. Now, I can't tell you what I'll know by then compared to what I know by now, so I can't I, I can't commit to how I'll feel. But I don't think I would kill Rand Carthon on the radio if they went with Dallas Turner. Because the one thing I'll say about the draft is nobody remembers five years from now what you needed in the 2024 draft. Do you remember what the Titans needed in the 2014 draft when they took Taylor Lewan? I don't. I know they had two tackles. Does anybody remember what the Rams needed that same draft when they drafted Aaron Donald? Did they need a defensive lineman? I don't know. But I know Aaron Donald was a pretty good player. Nobody remembers what you needed. When the Titans drafted Caleb Farley, what did they, I don't even remember what they needed. I'm sure they needed a wide receiver because they always need a wide receiver. But I mean, I can't even, did they need a corner? Did they just get a corner? Like, I don't know. So I think about the pass rusher position and I'm like, I don't have a problem with this. If Rand Carthon and the coaching staff, they decide that Dallas Turner, and everybody says Dallas Turner's the top edge rusher in this draft. And I will say this, Jared versus in this class, he could end up being a pretty good player. Like if he's Micah Parsons, 
or if he's Javon Curse, or if he's Lawrence Taylor, be hard for me to say, well, you know, we need such and such instead, so don't take Lawrence Taylor. So I'm not going to go crazy if that happens. Now, they'll have to figure out what they're going to do at tackle if they end up doing it. But pass rusher is a very premium position. And I think I read somewhere that, like, Dallas Turner, when he was a true freshman, came in off the street as a freshman right out of high school and was just dominating these Alabama tackles that are now in the NFL. So maybe there's something to that. So I'm not going to go crazy about that. Then Pat Kerwin, and you know I love Pat, but Pat Kerwin had a second Titans pick, and this I don't know about. San Francisco on the clock with the 30th or 31st overall pick. What do you think in here? Yeah, well, I promised the ten- Tennessee fans that I'd get back in the first round when we took the big pass rusher earlier, uh, Dallas Turner. I know you're picking at 38, and there was a chance, but I've been watching the run on tackles. It started, so I had to make a move here, which is fine. Tennessee is moving into the first round with San Francisco's agreement here, and they're going to give away next year's first-round pick for this. It sounds like, well, is there should be more. I almost gave him a fourth, but when you consider that San Francisco's down here at 31 and most likely they're going to be at the bottom of the round again next year, and you've got to look at Tennessee, like they're going to be somewhere around 16, 15, 16, 14, right in there. So they're going to take that upgrade, probable upgrade, and make this move, and Tennessee is going to come and get a tag. I'm nervous about Once you took Mims... I started to think, uh-oh, we're getting close. And last week, Kansas City uh, took a tackle. So the thought of a guy getting a 38 was starting to fall apart for me. I walked in, gave it away now, and I'll take the tackle. Um, and you can chime those bells because it's done. He can play left. He can play right. I watched him all week at the Senior Bowl. He is physical as can be. Um, and he will be able to plug in start pretty quickly. His name's Jordan Morgan from Arizona. Okay. So Pat Kerwin thinks it's a good idea to trade next year's first-round pick to jump back into the first round and to draft Jordan Morgan at the end of the first round. If that happens, first of all, let's say that that's what happens on draft night. I'll be shocked when the Titans draft Dallas Turner because everything the Titans have done in free agency, everything the Titans have done there has pointed to us that they're going to take a left tackle. So I'll be shocked if they draft Dallas Turner. But hey, it's all about drafting the best players, not necessarily drafting for need. Don't have a problem with that. You turn around and trade next year's first to hop into the bottom end of this year's first round, you got fired the general manager. I mean, I would be screaming, I don't know where this draft show is going to be, I don't know where I'm going to be. Because the first round of the NHL playoffs might be that week, so I don't know where. But let's say it was like last year at Twin Peaks when I just went crazy. When they drafted Skaronsky, it'll be that times a thousand. Like, there's no way Pat Kerwin can actually think that that is a good idea to trade next year's first round pick. And I would understand if you were trading next year's first round pick to jump back into the first round to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. But I am not okay with trading next year's first round pick to draft the sixth or seventh tackle when you can wait until 38. Next year's first round pick, who really knows if Will Levis is going to make it? I don't. Next year's first round pick, if Will Levis doesn't make it, could be number three overall. If you called San Francisco today and offered next year's first for 31, they'd do it. In fact, I'd like to know who wouldn't look at the Titans and see a team that doesn't have a tackle and would say, yeah, we'll give you our first this year to get your first next year. Because that first, a lot of people, most people think Will Levis sucks, by the way, just so you all know that, including people in the NFL who didn't draft him when they had the opportunity. So you mean to tell me that like that, that we can just do that? You know what? I'll trade next year's first. And I thought about even trading a fourth. What? If Rand Carthon does that, he should be fired on the spot. 
And I've always said this, that if I owned a team, I would never meddle on the day-to-day, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, whatever. I wouldn't do it. You can't do that. But that would be one where if the conversation is had of, oh, yeah, we, uh, Mr. Stillman, we think that we should trade next year's first-round pick to move back into the very end of the first round to draft this tackle who might be good. I don't know. I'm like, are you, are you seriously bringing this to my attention? Because if you're seriously bringing this to my attention, then, I mean, you, you can be kidding me. So the first thing I don't think is the end of the world. Now, I don't know what they're going to do at tackle. But the second thing, I mean, that's just inexcusable. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Field Yates has J.J. McCarthy on his latest big board at 21. Mel Kuyper last week had J.J. McCarthy at 14 on his big board. So this idea that J.J. McCarthy is going to go in the top four seems at least a little facetious. But I do believe that J.J. probably ends up in the top ten somewhere before all of those teams that use a quarterback or could use a quarterback land, which takes me to the Titans. And why one thing that happened on this moving the chains mock draft made me think, You know what? The Titans may be able to have their cake and eat it, too. We'll do that next. 615-737-1025. If you want to weigh in, it's Stillman and Company on 1025-1063 The Game.
So that leaves uh, the Cincinnati Bengals on the clock with the 18th overall selection. Pat, can't believe this guy's still here. Uh, they did just sign a tackle Trent Brown, but we know it's been up and down for him uh, his entire NFL career. So let's play. We, we need to draft a tackle here. So the pick is in. With the 18th overall selection, the Cincinnati Bengals will be selecting Big Joe Alt. Tackle out of Notre Love Dame. Six foot eight, three 322 pounds. Three-year starter, team captain as well. So 32 starts were all at left tackle, but he'll be, we'll be mixing him and moving him around a little bit. Has the size and length and uh, is a pretty polished player, uh, as we know. Okay. So that is the Move in the Chains mock draft on Sirius XM NFL Radio. 18 for Joe Alt. 18. I mean, are we serious about this? 18? But I was thinking, because I have proposed a trade. So I just don't believe that J.J. McCarthy is going to go with the fourth or fifth pick. All of the scuttlebutt is that there are going to be four quarterbacks within the first five picks, right? And we all know Williams, May, Daniels. Okay. Then there's McCarthy, who's gotten hot of late. Minnesota, after the combine, added the second first rounder, which seemed like a message that with Kirk Cousins gone, they are intent upon getting their next quarterback. And so either they got to move all the way up to three in order to get one of those three, or they go at four, whatever. And I did the math last week, and I told you guys that a fair trade would be the Titans giving seven to Minnesota, seven and 38 in exchange for 11, 23, and 108. So you get an extra player out of this. You get three, they get two. You get the extra player, and you get the better second player, but they get the better first player. I think it's a fair trade, according to the chart and everything else. And this would allow them, instead of having to move up to four or five, where those teams would want 11, or would want 11 and 23, they get 38 in return. That would allow you to draft at least one left tackle. If it's not all, we're talking about Fatanu or Fashnu, whatever. But I did wonder, if Joe Alt doesn't go to the Titans, then where does Joe Alt go, right? Again, quarterback, quarterback, we assume New England at three quarterback. Four, Arizona has Paris Johnson, who they drafted in the top ten last year. They don't need a left tackle. Five, the Chargers have Sean Slater. They don't need a left tackle. Six, the Giants, Andrew Thomas. They don't need a left tackle. Eight, Atlanta doesn't need a left tackle. Nine, Chicago has Braxton Jones. Now, I think that would be the team that would take Alt if he's there at nine and the three receivers aren't. So here's how the move in the chains mock draft with Jim Miller and Pat Kerwin, here's how they went about kind of filling out between the Titans taking Dallas Turner out of Alabama at seven before you get to Alt because every other mock draft that I've seen, whether it's Daniel Jeremiah, Mel Kuyper Jr., Charles Davis, it's all seven, Joe Alt. Here you go. Eight, Atlanta takes Terion Arnold, the corner out of Alabama. Nine, Chicago takes Jared Verse out of Florida State. Ten, again, this is moving the chain, Sirius XM NFL Radio. The Jets take Brock Bowers out of Georgia. Eleven, Vegas trades up for Roma Dunze. 12, Arizona, who makes a deal with Denver. Denver takes J.J. at 4. Arizona takes Quinion Mitchell, the corner out of Toledo. 13, Indianapolis makes a trade up for Latu Latu out of UCLA. 14, New Orleans takes Talis Fuaga out of Oregon State. 15, Minnesota from Indianapolis takes Michael Penix Jr. 16, Seattle takes Troy Falatanu out of Washington. 17, Jacksonville takes Nate Wiggins, the corner out of Clemson. 18, they have Joe Walt going to Cincinnati. I think that's crazy talk. But here's my question. If you make that trade with Minnesota, and Minnesota trades to seven, what are the odds that Chicago at nine with Braxton Jones, who's uh, at left tackle, 
what are the odds that Chicago takes Alt, and what are the odds that the Jets, who signed injury risk Tyron Smith to a one-year contract, what are the odds they pass on Alt? Now, I can see Chicago talking them into, well, you know, Braxton Jones is serviceable, so we're not going to, but we're talking about Joe Alt. is a franchise left tackle. And then with the Jets, if they were any other organization, I would say, well, they're going to take the left tackle. But knowing the Jets, Aaron is going to throw a freaking fit if they don't draft. You know, he probably looks at it like, what do you mean left tackle? We have a left tackle. Tyron Smith is our left tackle. Aaron, Tyron Smith hasn't played a full season since 2015. I trust Tyron Smith. We need Brock Bowers. We need this. We need that. And since Aaron is pretty much the coach and general manager of that team, I could see Aaron Rodgers shutting that down. But I still have a hard time believing that Joe Alt's actually getting to 18. The question is, can you get to 11, still get Alt, and then have moved up from 38 to 23 with Minnesota, and then at 23, maybe Fuaga is available. Maybe one of these other right tackles is available, or a really good defensive player, or something like that. At least worth thinking about. For me, is how far can you move down And still get all. I asked Bill Zimmerman, who I used to work with at Sirius, who's a big Chicago Bears guy. He covers the Bears. They got some blog or something. I said, how good is the Bears left tackle? And he said, he's very average. Great value on a rookie contract, but you would not feel good paying him 16 to 18 million dollars a year. If the big three wide receivers are gone at nine and the Bears can't trade down, I think they take a left tackle because they don't feel like the edges are worth the pick at nine, but I'm not sure. So it's not even like, a, oh, yeah, they take Joe Alt. But I think they might. Like, I do think that they at that point might. They got a right tackle and Darnell Wright. But if you're telling me, like, yeah, you wouldn't feel good about giving this guy $17 bucks a year, then what you're telling me is that your left tackle is the equivalent of Amani Hooker, and Joe Alt's supposed to be better than that. Phone line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com at 615-737-1025. Dylan says, I, for one, will lose my mind if they draft a pass rusher at 7. Trade back if you can. Let me ask you this question. What if your research tells you Chad Brinker's Curing Cancer AI Business School Model. What if it tells you that Dallas Turner is the next Lawrence Taylor? That Dallas Turner is the next Javon Curse? That that Dallas Turner is Micah Parsons? Shows up day one and becomes the star of the league defensively. Then will you lose your mind? then will you be against it? Because I won't be. And he is the top pass rusher in this class. And we have no idea how good that means he is or he isn't. I'm not too worried about the position as long as it's not, you know, guard or kicker. Alex says, Jared, who is Pat Kerwin? He sounds like he's not credible and he's never correct or made one notable draft pick or blah, blah, blah. Alex from Franklin doesn't like what he heard, so he's going to question the credentials. Pat Kerwin was a scout for a long time in the NFL. So long ago that he scouted, I looked this up, Ian, for the Phoenix Cardinals. Oh, it's a throwback. That's how long he's been scouting. He was an assistant coach, too, for the Jets, and then later was their like lead contract negotiator and salary cap manager. I'd say that's more football than you and me, if I, just, if I had to be honest with you there. One texture says Green Bay would be a team to watch for on all. Where's Green Bay picking? Green Bay made the playoffs last year. So I'm not sure I'm all that worried about this. Gino says if their number seven pick isn't a tackle, I would take Bowers. At least he could help chip a defensive end or helping the inept tackles or release as an outlet for Levis. Agree or disagree that that is a dumb train of thought? I mean, I think that when we talk about positional value, And again, if Brock Bowers is like Travis Kelsey or Gronk, that's a different discussion. But when we're talking about positional value, edge rusher is infinitely more important than tight end. And if Dallas Turner's the best, at least I know this, it's seven. If I'm not going to get the best left tackle in this draft, I'd rather, in theory, have the best pass rusher in a draft than the best tight end in a draft. 
Chuck says, what quarterback do I think has the best chance of being a bust like the 21 draft? Whoever the Patriots take. I think the Patriots' biggest problem is that Robert Kraft still thinks they're the Patriots. And their moves in the offseason, promoting a coach, promoting people in the front office, signing a bunch of their own guys, not really signing other guys in free agency, their moves shout, we think Bill Belichick was our only problem. And that roster has a lot more problems than just Bill Belichick. Now, Bill may have caused a lot of them, but, I mean, I think they need some outside help here. And they didn't get any. And so I think that the New England Patriots are ripe for ruining a quarterback. I think the Bears have actually set up their quarterback with some success because Keenan Allen's a veteran, DJ Moore's a veteran. I mean, I wouldn't rule out the Bears taking a tackle if their left tackle's average. I wouldn't rule that out. They've got draft picks. Now, I hate their coaching situation, and so I think that might be a problem. But they say Caleb Williams is all that in a bag of chips, so I'd have to say is Washington has a ton of draft picks. They spent money in free agency. I don't really like Cliff Kingsbury, but as a coordinator, maybe I can live with it. I'll say whoever the Patriots take, that's the quarterback that I would worry about the most. If it's just me. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. We have got a ball game tonight. Get some thoughts on that. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game. Let's talk about FanDuel Sportsbook, and let's talk about Dinger Tuesdays. That's right. Dingers, blasts, moonshots, the long ball, whatever you want to call it. Everybody loves home runs. And with FanDuel's Dinger Tuesdays, you can love them even more. Because Dinger Tuesdays are back for another season on America's number one sportsbook and my official sportsbook app, the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Just bet on a player to hit a home run, and FanDuel will give you $5 in bonus bets for every home run hit during that game. As if you need another reason to love the long ball. And let's not forget, chicks dig the long ball. Visit FanDuel.com slash JGM to get in on all the Dinger Tuesday action. That's FanDuel.com slash JGM, again, to get in on all that Dinger Tuesday action and make your bets more with FanDuel, my official sportsbook app, and an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. 21 and over and present in Tennessee. First online real money wager only for the most part when it comes to these great FanDuel offers here on the program, and my computer just crapped out on me, so let me, give me a second, so I can read to you all of this fine print here at the bottom, on Dinger Tuesday, here we go, 21 and over in present Tennessee, uh, Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max bonus $25. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fandle.com. Gambling problem called Tennessee Redline at 1 800 89 
Let me say this first. Legitimately, I think you can look at the women's games tonight. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the biggest nights in the history of women's college basketball. Yeah. I, I, I don't care what anybody says. Right? And as, as far as I'm concerned, right now, they're more popular than the men's. Okay, we're looking at UConn, and UConn looks head and shoulders, well, even though Tennessee and Purdue, that was a phenomenal game yesterday. The, the bottom line is we're looking at UConn. And, I, yo, Andrea, Shannon, it was 23-23. I, I, man, man, I went and got some food from Carmen. I turned around, and they were down 30. It was 53-23. <laughs> to 23. It was a 30 to nothing run. You just said, damn. I mean, that, right. UConn is just on that level, okay? And obviously, we look at the women's game, and we look at South Carolina, and that's subject that we're going to broach because back-to-back -back undefeated regular season by Dawn Staley and the University of South Carolina is a lot to be said. But when you talk about tonight a rematch of the national championship game, right. Caitlin Clark, the best player in the game, the most renowned player in the game, going up against Angel Reese and the reigning defending champions, the national champions that is LSU, that is the LSU Tigers. I mean, you look at a matchup like this, and this is epic. I can't wait. I'm going to be by my tele. I'm going to be right in front of my television. I ain't missing this, okay? Okay, tonight it's the rematch. Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. And regardless of whatever you think of women's basketball or whatever you think, you know, I heard, I think it was Derek said today that Juju Watkins at USC is better than Caitlin Clark. And I was like, okay, that's a hot take, boy, I'll tell you. But let me say this. I'm watching tonight, and I bet a lot of America does too. Think about it. There's nothing else to watch. What else, What's on TV tonight? Nothing. So, this is the perfect time. you got to give ESPN their props for finding the perfect time to put this game on when there's nothing else going on, and we're getting Caitlin Clark, the best women's college player maybe ever, versus Angel Reese, who is, you know, kind of the Magic Johnson to her Larry Bird. And I saw that Angel Reese came out yesterday and said, there's no bad blood between me and Caitlin Clark, and, you know, we're just talking trash, and that is what it is. But let me say this, and she's probably right. Like, as far as Caitlin Clark hating Angel Reese in the way that you might hate somebody, you're probably right. But Caitlin Clark is a stone-cold killer. At least I think that. And the thing about these stone-cold killers, like Jordan, like Brady, these guys don't talk, they, they don't take that talking very well. So you put that ring finger in her face. If she's like Michael Jordan, she's going to make them pay for it. Plus, I can't stand Kim Mulkey, and I can't stand Haley Van Lith. So go, Iowa. I'm rooting for the Hawkeyes tonight. That's going to do it for us here on the program. The Commodore Hour is next. Stillman and Company. We'll see everybody tomorrow, too.